yeah, yeah. yeah. I was actually, did you? No, there was no, nobody knows that. A bit small for me. Uh, uh, if you right, the shirt, last so, minute. Yeah, last minute change. Back out, yeah. But no one could see us, obviously, just yet, so it was all in vain. Yeah. What were we talking about? Big Ron, Mighty, Mighty Ducks. Ducks. Uh, Bolton and Barnsley, by the way, played tonight in the second leg of their League One playoff semi-final. 1-1 one, one after the first leg, so the winner has the uh, the joy of playing a rejuvenated Sheffield Wednesday in the final. Um, Brighton were very disappointed last night. The 4-1 um, result did not really reflect the game, but mm. it felt that... Um, what am I looking at? It felt that uh, they... Uh, oh, go ahead. What, 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 no, go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, okay, good. Um, <laughs> uh, it felt that 4 1 was ridiculous. Oh, we're on video. Brighton, Brighton were. Uh, good morning and welcome to everybody who's joining us on the, um, yeah. the, other, the other streams. It's uh, 7 43. Delighted to have you with us. Um, everybody Truly. else has been with us for the last 10 minutes or yeah. thereabouts on the app. So where were you? Yeah. Download the app. The OGs yeah. of the app. The OGs yeah. of the app. 4 um, 1 was not a fair reflection of the game. 2 uh, 1. Uh, it was probably about it. To be fair, Newcastle were definitely the better team. Brighton were obviously chasing it at that point, um, but they were very. They were just even. Even regardless, even at two one, they just uh, felt like because Brighton's everybody's second team. They were disappointing. Um, do you think that Brighton are quite happy not to play in Europe next season and are doing their level best to not deliberately lose or draw a game, but being like, eh, it wouldn't be the end no. of the world if we didn't play? No. No? No. Not having that theory at all? Surely they want Europe. So why didn't they start the likes of McAllister and Cecil and Ferguson last night against the might of Newcastle at St. James' I, Park? I don't know. Is it not unusual? Sure, the, sure the I, did, I did wonder it and then um, McAllister comes on and um, you know they things start to turn around a little bit Ferguson comes on mm. wasn't as central a character last night Ferguson as, no, he was, as he I've was seen fine. him before he, he was, was a, a little bit peripheral at times and like he obviously plays in a position where that can be the case anyway yeah. he has to come a little bit deep to try and get involved which he did a few times gets a nice little touch here and there and then tries to rework himself back into the play but they're obviously a team that also have an awful lot of ballers like yeah McAllister, um, Matoma. Um, yeah, it wasn't, but it wasn't even the omission of Ferguson that stood out to me. It was, but, you know, but the, but, their best but the, My point being that he's not really, um, like we're obviously extremely focused on him. You turn on Brighton all the time to watch him. Mm. Uh, certainly last night, it's not, I don't know if last night was typical. Obviously he didn't start the game either, but um, he wasn't as centrally involved as I would like to have seen him. You know, he wasn't actually on the ball an awful lot. No, I think um, he just needed kind of the rhythm of the game to be caught up with and he didn't and like when he I saw him collecting the ball with his back to goal about 50 yards out and once or twice he had a heavy touch but at the same time you're playing against an extremely good Newcastle side yeah. who, you know very confident last night knew they had the upper hand and um, I'm quoting Phil Egan in the office this morning saying that Newcastle just bullied Brighton mm. and um, they could have yeah. they could have scored whenever they wanted really and you were saying that you thought 2-1 was a fair reflection but Callum Wilson had another one on one. Could have been five at the end. Yeah, well, that, that, that's you know I mean? at that stage, the heads were gone. But, they, uh, the but, heads they, were totally but when he went through one on one to score the third, um, wasn't surprised at all. It was going that way. The game yeah. was going that way. No, no, I think they, I Brighton had moments, but no truck with the outcome. Do you think that that's a, a fair reflection of the difference between the sides? Are Newcastle three goals better off no, than Brighton? No, 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 I don't, I don't think, think so. so. Although I'm worried for their Brighton next season because the, the comments from Deserby last week seem to suggest that McAllister will be gone next season. I said it will. Be I think gone McAllister next will go. Both of them will. Does be Evan gone. Ferguson survive the summer at Brighton? Oh yeah. Well, the contract's so recent that surely. Well, you know what? I wouldn't. Good, good I wouldn't, reason, I wouldn't to, jump good reason to, to top up the transfer. Cash in. Yeah, I wouldn't yes. jump into the. Oh yeah, just because you just don't know what's going to happen over the summer and who's going to lose their job well, and yeah. suddenly watch jobs become available. Like you have it on the back page of some of the papers this morning. The special one, mm-hmm. special interest in Ferguson um, that Jose wants him. Jose's I mean, hot again, isn't he? Maybe he does, maybe he does. He's it. brought Roma to a second crying last European night. final. Was he crying last night? I think I saw pictures of him crying. He had zero night. shots on target and 28% possession. That is classic Jose. Yeah, that, that nothing more Roma. that he would love than <laughs> doing that. It was just Roma. Yeah. It was Jose's Roma. Look, they won the inaugural Europa Conference League last year. And yeah. now they are in the Europa League final. Next season, Champions League final. A grand national for all surrounds. That's what he did with Porto. There you go. Yeah, Conference League. That's, that's what he did. Yeah. <laughs> he did that with Porto. The UEFA Cup 2003, mm. Champions League 2004. That's a Jose special. Mm. Speaking of, we buried the lead, in my opinion. Right. West Ham. Yeah. Into their first European final in 47 years. Pablo Fornells scoring one of the better they, away they European been... goals. Picked up the ball just inside the AZ half. Lo- lovely little nutmeg. He ran, he ran the pitch, he said this morning. He, oh, he's he's downgrading uh, now, is he? But you say he ran Just the pitch. inside uh, the opposition half equals half the pitch. I thought you said he ran the you pitch. You See, I'm having that. Okay. I'm having half the pitch. Lovely yeah. megs and a lovely finish. There'd have been an awful lot more European finals if there was a Grand National for also runs over those 47 years. Going back to that. No, but I'm just saying that. that, like, I just think, 
it's a great achievement. Of course it is. It's brilliant to have those games. Mm. Of course it is. I feel exactly the same about the Talton Cup. Like it's a good, positive thing to do. But I just think saying, oh, they're in a first European final in 47 years, glasses over the fact that they've created a new grad national for Ulcer Yeah. <laughs> that but hold on now a second. Years. Do you know what I'm saying? But that, that's fair comment. Like, yeah, I'm, not, no, I'm, not being, uh, I'm not being... Uh, yeah. uh, curmudgeonly a little, about it a little just a little but now I think it's a good thing that this league was created uh, when it was initially I thought to myself oh geez, another one another like another, another more Thursday night football what's next though? but it's actually brilliant for the likes I, I'm of not, West Ham I'm not don't misrepresent like what I'm saying here I, I literally said the exact same thing I know but I'm just I just want to absolutely clarify that okay it, it's made, it's made you, up you, but so is every competition if you and I were sitting here in May 1992 you like just Premier League things. Jeez. No, but you'd still be around. You'd still be around. You're, you're talking about the same elite. You know, you're talking about whether it's the Champions League or the European Cup or the Premier League or the First Division. There's the same elite thing. Whereas yeah. this is like a third level tournament for teams that just wouldn't. That just those teams just would not have had those. Well, I, you're in favour of it. Of course, I am. Yeah. The top what seven qualify for Europe? Is it six qualify for Europe in the Premier League? Or who qualifies for the Conference League is it sixth? Goes to eighth, I think. Yeah, well, see, the, the, the problem is now they're going to invent another There's tournament. There's one for everyone in the audience. For that. It'll be the top ah, ten. Stop. Yeah. It'll eventually be the, the relegation conference, conference teams will be League. playing. It'll be like a relegation cup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Europe. Too yeah. much. Yeah, yeah, too much yeah. from you there. Yeah. Um, are you having this comment? Here we go. From Shane. Uh, we're far too obsessed with Evan Ferguson. He's 18. Let him develop. He's not going to play every game. He's not going to finish the season with more than a handful of goals. And that's fine. Do we need to check ourselves here? No, enjoy it. It's yeah. great fun. Um, Evan Ferguson is a very level-headed mm. fella who's uh, not getting carried away too much with all of this. By all accounts, from whatever you hear him uh, speak. So um, the alternative is to like measure your expectations or your excitement. And I mean, can we live a little? Live a little. Let it go. Just unleash, unleash the, 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 the power of joy and happiness when we see a footballer from this country who can score goals. Yeah. And do the work he's doing at his age. Uh, Mark Dunning has pointed out that the playoff semi final last night was incredible, akin to Barca PSG. Do you remember that game, the Champions League yeah, semi final, yeah. the Neymar game? That was and uh, just to let everyone know, we were talking about that before we came on camera. But yeah, it's Liverpool it's important, Milan to, important a, to reiterate. In a, big, in a full game. Incredible. Um, we need to come back at some point to my disappointment about the Viva last Saturday. Oh, talk to us. You're you're amongst monster fans. Yeah, well, it was obviously everybody's in together, so you just take whatever you're given. And um, it's mad, isn't it? In rugby, that well, I suppose it makes sense. Nobody's going to be pucking the heads off each other as a thing. No, um, no, no. I don't mean physically pucking, but I mean like if it gets t- game gets tense and tight. Ah, but you want a bit of that. I love a bit of that. A yeah, little bit yeah, of yeah. sort of ribbon and whatever. Was you're there any of that? Stuff. No, there was. There was. There, hands are getting equally, you know, excited or whatever, and you're sort of quietly layering it into your opposite number up the way. But the I was there with the two kids. All the Leinster flags were out. Mm. We were sat beside some Munster fans, and um, I love the way he says that, like as if it's some sort of a slight, like a team cheer, just, uh, supporters just, cheering just, on their team, Shane. Like as if it's. Some, I've been getting. As you know, going to Ulster games. Well, it's, that's, yeah. that's what happens. I've been getting awful hate on YouTube from Leinster fans in the last couple of weeks because a couple of weeks ago I said it wouldn't be great to see Raj winning a win a yeah. their Champions Cup. I and do remember that. that I've been getting nothing, fire but, nothing but hate since. Yeah. I'd, of course, be great if Leinster won. Just back down a little bit. Do you think it's totally fine that? I would lean towards La Rochelle here because of Ron Lockhart. So I think that's totally fine. No. Do you, under, do you understand that? He's caught, man. I mean, that makes total sense. Well, it depends on how far you go with that. Are you going to the game? No, I'm in Sligo. Uh-huh. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with anyone from, from outside. I think if you turn up an Irish person who turns up on Saturday wearing a yellow jersey and all in is more doing it because they're anti Leinster as opposed to Sport Nogara. I think that's the. Yeah, I wouldn't, that's go, the I wouldn't go that far. I won't go that far. Uh, anyway, we were sat beside some lovely Munster people and yeah. seven to two kids and uh, we were having a bit of a crack beforehand. I was like, oh, we're at this end. That's great. I was saying to the uh, four-year-old, that's great. We'll see all the Leinster tries going in down here. Oh. Like, you know. here but it was go. a good bit of fun during the game. So disappointing. So disappointing afterwards. Well, not, no, but that's no that's that's Chris for the middle for the a kids at an age course. where they're dis- disappointed with the result or do they, do they actually care? Um, th- probably the latter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not yeah. really. They're not really not really they got the flag. The most important thing was they got the flags in the way. And well, listen, that's all that matters. You pay the five on the flag, Shane, and I think the flag is for the bin now. Like so the quality of those things is. You they're probably want to be buying it, putting a bit of effort in and buying it in the official shop before. What the scarf? See what this is. Uh, this is a shame now. What's a shame? We have to. We're going to have to go here. The three of us. You're what away. Do you think you're, would you're, if you're the producer o- wasn't on air. Hold on. You're away. You're away show. next week. I'm away. Yeah. Then I'm away the following two Fridays. Oh, wow. So we're not going to see wow, each other wow. for a long time. Anywhere else? I'm away. Yeah. You're away. Where are you going? Where are you going? No, I've asked you. Come on. Where are you going? <laughs> Come on. Where are you going first? Started so finish. Where are you going? I've asked you. So I think what we're going to have to do now is the coming up. 
Yeah, and then we'll have to get himself on there. He's in the box, ready to go. He's not happy. Yeah. He, doesn't, he doesn't want all the OTB fans knowing where he's headed. The two of you don't. You are both fucking... This fame's getting to your heads. Here's what's uh, coming up to you now in Tenfield this morning. Alan Quinlan is busting the door down and he's going to come in here in a minute and tell us why Larry Shell are going to beat Leinster this weekend. Um, we've a uh, Jilly Flaherty coming up a little bit later on. It's the uh, crunch time in the Women's Super League. Uh, we've Deirdre Gogarty, who was Ireland's um, the first ever professional fight that was ever held in Ireland. Uh, Deirdre Gogarty in the early 90s and obviously in the context of the Katie fight this weekend. A great opportunity to have Deirdre in the studio, so we'll do that uh, for you a little bit later on. We will have David Brady to discuss the weekend's football. Uh, is it interesting stuff? I'm not sure. It we'll, is, yeah. David Brady will decide that for mm. us a little bit later on. And then Jess Kelly is going to do a slot about chat GPT and what, yeah, why and what you need to know about it. We have a lovely treat there. Do stay tuned for that slot, everybody. It's going to be a lot of fun. Jess has created something magical. That's all we need to say. Mm. Now, uh, loads of comments coming in. We will reverse into those a little bit later Ooh. on. But uh, before all of that, we are with you, of course, with uh, Gillette Labs, who are <laughs> get the ultimate shape for your money back. <laughs> Neon Night Edition. I'm rattled. I'm still rattled from last week. He's gone. Neon it's Night gone. Edition is available now. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> over the next few weeks, OTB are uh, travelling to France in style. Uh, we've been to France in style with Irish Ferries and exploring what Nantes, Bordeaux and La Rochelle have to offer ahead of Rugby World Cup. So it's all in partnership with Irish Ferries. See Travel Differently. Here's a short clip from the series. It's Alan Quinlan. Uh, talking to our own Ashling about Alan's uh, World Cup experience with Ireland. Back with Quinny next. OTB AM. The Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball. Have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? Someone from down the country tells you to F off. You, you give out to them, you, you, you go, don't speak to me like that. That's not acceptable. But if someone from Dublin does it, he actually doesn't. He's not telling me. Ah, this is culture bias. This is bias against culture. Yeah, here, but so we a, can't say it, but you can say it. Yeah, so it's it's part of our DNA and our language. It's completely different. It's uh, using ah, your own here. language. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts, and download the OTB Sports app. Just speaking about some of the players that are going to be experiencing the World Cup for the first time. I'm sure there's a lot of pressures and the unknown for them as well. What was it like for you, Alan, when you went to your first World Cup? Well, that was in 99. It was on home soil. It was in France, Ireland and the UK. Got my first cap. Uh, my World Cup lasted about five days because we beat Romania on Friday night and then we had to play Argentina in Lons on the Tuesday night and uh, we were knocked out, so it was over pretty quick. Uh, better memories than Adelaide. Well, yeah double-edged sword. I got injured there, dislocated my shoulder in scoring against Argentina. Again, we were knocked out of the quarterfinals by France. 07 then was in, in France, yeah. so that was in Bordeaux. We played a couple of games in Paris and uh, played in Bordeaux. Yeah, that wasn't a good World Cup either. I'm not sure I've, I've, I've the right advice for any Irish players. They're, they're very experienced now and I think mm. they've been to New Zealand, they've won a Six Nations. It's a little bit different a World Cup and there'll be expectation and pressure in Ireland because we've never gone past the quarterfinals so they'll be pretty aware and conscious of that bit of extra pressure and expectation now because they're ranked number one in the world. Yeah. What may benefit this team is what happened in 2019. I think in one sense it's a good situation and lots of these players don't have the baggage of previous World Cups. True. But ultimately no matter what has happened in the past, it's all about what they can produce and do themselves. OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. Uh, 7.57, you're welcome along to OTB AM. Alan Quinlan, good morning to you. Good morning, lads, how are you? Uh, not, sort of sweaty palms, a little bit nervous, still reeling from last weekend and just this, it's been a whirlwind week, Quinny, and I'm um, not sure what to expect tomorrow. You uh, you were, he, I saw some... A whirlwind uh, what? Like, what just, are you, what just, are you I'm, sweaty I'm rattled, palms? I'm rattled, rattled, What's wrong with I'm rattled like, after last week. Leinster fans you're don't constantly to winning, beating everyone all season and... Well... You know, one, one. How, 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 try to be a lose, Munster fan. If try to be a Munster tomorrow, fan. Well, or, it's a good time to be a Munster fan. If they lose tomorrow, a little it's bit of a long time between drinks. Sure. You know, he, he. There was some some video footage going around yesterday of himself and the team walking into the Black Rock pub. Raj. Black Rock mm. and uh, himself, the whole is that team. What you're calling the team, the team in, in tow, and he looked like Lord of the Manor strutting around South Dublin. Um, you were you were onto him. I just briefly chatting to him during the week. Um, I was trying to stay away, really, because um, it's a different week for everyone, really, isn't it? For Leinster and La Rochelle, and, and this is the pinnacle, really. This is the 
top table stuff, you know, and it's it's you've got to keep your focus, and he'll know better than that, as will, you know, Leo, Leo as well about keeping focus, blocking out the outside noise, a lot of focus on will it, you know, Leinster losing to Munster last weekend, will it affect him? If it was the same team that's gone out tomorrow, it possibly could, but it's a different side for Leinster. It's you know, there's eleven, twelve internationals coming back into that side, and well. The, Top he, quality players. Ronan O'Gara himself in the examiner this morning says that uh, I'm going to butcher the phrase now, but that it was a slap or some sort of a um, punch for Leinster, the Leinster environment, the Leinster group. That that it is a factor going into the week. Mm-hmm. That like that, that you know that. James Tracy was saying on the show during the week that they when they win together, they win together. When they lose, no matter what the players are, that everybody is lost. That. They'll be disappointed, there's yeah. no no doubt about that. And I think um, the mood in the camp would have been uh, a little bit low um, initially, but you've got to move your focus and change it pretty quickly, I think. Um, if they can, you know, obviously if 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 it was, if Le- La Rochelle were to win tomorrow and it would end up being a trophyless season again for Leinster, yes, it would be incredibly disappointing because there's an expectation there. An expectation drives... The narrative, really, of what you should and shouldn't do, and what you should achieve, because when you have the quality of Leinster, and it obviously would have a, you know, maybe a little kick-on effect into in, into Ireland as well, going to a World Cup and their preparation. So, from an Irish point of view, it'd be very good for Leinster to win this game tomorrow, um, and get a little bit of a feel-good factor heading into the summer and preparing. Um, but last week for me. You know, you, you, it, it's definitely disappointing. There's no doubt about it. And the fact that it, I'm not saying it wouldn't hurt. Of course, it would hurt. That just shows the standard that what it means to win trophies and get trophies and stuff. They're hard to come by. Mm. No matter how good you are, you know, getting your hands on silverware, you've got to get a lot of stuff right. Manage a whole season. It's the same in other sports as well. So, it will have affected them, but. You know, the reality here is when you start looking around the dressing room on Monday morning and you see the big guns are are all sitting around there, you're going, this is exciting. So you've got to turn it around and make it exciting. European rugby for me was always a week that was special. It just had that feel that this is, you know, this is really special. And a lot of players say that. And it's not disrespecting the league in any way. I think the URC has gone to a level now that's far more competitive, far more exciting, fulfilling throughout the whole season, which has been brilliant um, with the South Africans coming into it and the competition. But Europe just, there's a certain amount of adrenaline. And listen, Leinster have been so dominant throughout the whole competition. They've been the best team all year. And La Rochelle, you know, on the other hand, have been probably just slightly behind them. If you were to go, who's the better side and who's been more consistent? La Rochelle got kind of a bit of a rattle with with, with Ulster in round three. Um, horrendous conditions given, but they were completely dominant throughout the pool stages. I was at the Gloucester game in the in the in the, yeah. the round sixteen game. The Gloucester, yeah, Gloucester game. La Rochelle Gloucester in the round sixteen game. They win by three points, late score to win the game. Very very nervous. They were, they were expected to beat them by twenty points that day. Possibly, and you know, I turned up very much relaxed to that game, thinking you know this will be great to see the atmosphere in, in the stadium in La Rochelle, the passion that they have for the game um, thinking that, and maybe the team turned up with the same and that kind of feel was there they were lucky to get through that game Gloucester were brilliant but probably a little bit of a reignition for, for them against Saracens in that semi-final they were just very very dominant uh, in the quarter-final and then they blew Exeter away in that semi-final so um Two great teams, so many strengths, so many players you could go through and talk about matchups. But you know, I think it's it's the mental side of this is an important part of it as well. Mm. A, a belt was how he uh, how he described mm-hmm. it for Lancaster. He did give the context, as you're saying, about obviously all the players coming back. What uh, body blow, I would say, not yeah. a significant blow, yeah, yeah. a kind of a. Well, still something that takes a little bit of the wind. A little bit winded. Sales, a little bit yeah. winded. Um, what I was sort of interested in the the chat. He had been flagging this up from weeks out about like last year's final is kind of irrelevant. That you know there are different players. Not too many actually on the Leinster side. Not a huge amount maybe on the Larishell side, but maybe in sort of key positions. And you know it's kind of irrelevant. But what's your expectation about? I heard James Tracy call, just saying that we expected a slugfest like. And, and even in terms of the playbook it depends what last way year. the players what? view each other in other words 
you know, when you're in a in a group like that in the dressing room, you know, how confident are you of getting the best better of the opposition of or how wary are you of, of their quality? So I think for La Rochelle, obviously coming to Dublin is more difficult and you're playing a top quality side. For Leinster, do they look back at any parts of that final last year and think we could have managed it better? Yes, mm -hmm. of course. That second period when they were eight points up, you think it's the game. Um, La Rochelle were hanging on at one stage and the game, I think Liebenberg got a massive turnover um, in the, 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 Lenz, the La Rochelle half of the field. They got a penalty. He won a brilliant turnover where Leinster looked like they were going to break through. They made line, a, a line break in the middle of that second half. Um, the management where Leinster kind of managed that game I think they'll look back in that. They'll have to be, like, it's a ridiculous thing to say about Leinster, but they'll have to be more clinical now. Yeah, and I think, look, La Rochelle are a very a, a robust side. To be fair, they're a little bit old school where they're 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 not afraid to man up, roll up the sleeves yeah. and kind of go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you as regards. They're hardy. And their try-line defence is off the charts good. It is, yeah. And, and by and large, defensively, they're very, very strong side yeah. and, and to break down. So certainly in the early parts of your attack, you've got to be pretty physical and clinical um, to get some inroads, which we know Leinster are capable of doing. And if they get the pace and tempo and flow, and, you know, Leinster's accuracy this year has been sensational, you know, offset piece, scrums, line-outs, like... They can nearly cut you open after one or two phases. Mm -hmm. um, so multi-phase, when you get into that kind of a scenario, then that's what Leinster will want, to get it into big phases where they can you know, get mismatches and stuff like that. But like I said about the, you know, is there any kind of thing in the back of anyone's mind about, about that final? They've got to bin that. I think they've got to back themselves and it's it's the way the coaches will present about showing this is look this is where we kind of slipped up last year. I think La Rochelle will certainly look at the period, the periods of dominance and take. They were on the rack there for a bit of that second half last year and hanging on. Ronald O'Gara won't want them in that situation. You want to try and keep control of the game, um, and it isn't all about just power for 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 La Rochelle. I think that's the rock that you know potentially anyone could 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 perish on if you focus on one thing because they actually play play rugby as well. They're dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at the centres that could play, Dante and uh, Satini, if they play, your man Satini is a serious stepper. He's, that little offload you know, in the semi-final. The scrum stuff. half is incredibly yeah. dangerous with his breaks. Um, it's, Ald it's a totally is a different wonderful narrative player. that lead into last year where we had it was like even though mm. Larchelle had beaten them in the semi-finals a couple of years previous and they'd been in the final of the year before there was still a little bit before they got over the line that bit of an underdog thing now it's like two heavyweights <laughs> yeah, it is, it out, yeah. isn't it? Yeah and, and I think the um, Hasta is very important for them yeah. you know he's he's still relatively inexperienced very talented player as is Ross Bourne for Leinster um, but you know, when you start looking at the Leinster team and you think of that front row of, of Porter and Sheehan Furlong, that, that's world class. Like, There's no doubt about it. It's top quality international level. If you are Leinster and you get some early kickable penalties, are you are you going for posts? Are you trying for tries early on? James Tracy was making the point for, during the week. For me, yeah. I'm going for posts. Right. It's cup final stuff. Yeah. I think cup finals for me, and I've always had this when I played, you may only win this game by a point, yeah. but a point is enough, Shane. And, you know, obviously if it's out near the touchline and the kick is difficult, mm. I think you're going to the corner. But if they're kickable and you think they're bankers of three points, and my attitude is there, kick the points, sprint back, receive the kickoff, and try and get into the opposition yeah. half of the field as quickly as you can. So have strategies of winning the kickoff and how do we end up in their half again so that... The next time we have a line out, um, it's our line out in their half, and we can actually start attacking again. Mm. And within a space of two or three or four minutes after kicking the points, we're back attacking again. That's where you put the pressure on the opposition. Easier said than done, but look, there is times where you go to the corner, and but I, I it's uh, you only know if there is strong defence, and and even in that game last week with Munster going to the corner a few times, you know it's easy say in hindsight, and I do I say this in commentary when you go to the corner any time when Ireland play, 
when you score the try, it's the correct decision. Genius. If you don't score the try, you're also watching the momentum of the game. Have you got? Is the arm wrestle going your favour a little bit? If you're is ahead, 15, yeah, and if you're if you're ahead, um, Adrian, and you you're kind of protecting a little bit of a lead, or say a ten minute block that you just want to take the sting and out of the opposition, and you're a couple of points ahead. You've a kickable penalty, but no, we'll kick to the corner. We'll try and win the line out. We'll spend five, ten minutes down here. We mightn't get a a score. But we're now we're kind of wearing them down a little bit. There's times when that that that's a good decision, but um, it's hard to break La Rochelle down physically as regards from all against yeah. him. But equally you, so, what, what it's hard to stop Leinster as well. Will you talk to us a bit about that? Because like, what do you do <clears throat> when that's that's one of their big weapons and that's coming at you? Like, sort of grand when it's in their own half. Maybe give away a penalty. Maybe you can sort of illegally disrupt it. But how how do you legally tackle that mall when it's coming at you? particularly inside your own 22? You've all got to be on it really quickly and move. Um, any sort of hesitancy for somebody at the front of the line or if it's thrown to the tail or urgency can make a real difference. So in simple terms, it's hard to describe it when you don't have kind of video analysis here. But if the ball is won beside me, you know, if I'm lifted beside that, that, that line-out receiver and he wins it, and he gets the ground and I'm still in the air, that means there's three people from my team who are involved in lifting me. Ineffective. How quickly yeah. can they let go of me and engage here to stop that drive forward? Does that mean so that... So a lot of the time with malls, um, Adrian, it's about the urgency of how do we react really quickly and get three or four or five guys in there really quickly against their three or four or five guys. So it's sometimes it's about getting that... You always or, hear... Or you choose not to contest. At the line Choose out. not to contest, but is you that, can, is that, you can is that still. Likely? But nowadays Leinster, in the modern game, you can contest and then react really quickly okay. and, and cause a bit of damage. So, a lot of teams are really good at splitting the lifter. So, if you're the receiving player and you've two lifters lifting a, a, a player, and as you're bringing him down to ground, the three of them become in that, your, on that, your own line. Out. Yeah, they become that front line. Yeah, if you can split them in any way. It just it From breaks. A point of view. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I'm trying to go one on one here um, against my opposite guy and try and split him a little bit away from the ball or get in there somewhere or wrap the guy who's won the ball in the lineup. So look, there's lots of things you can do, but the biggest thing to make it simple for the listeners is is urgency and getting in a low position, so they can win the ball cleanly and get it back to the hooker at the back of the mall. But if you have five or six guys who are working in, in tandem, who are now driving, trying to drive you the other way you have a certain amount of time that the referee says, use it, use it, use it, if you're not going forward. If you get momentum going forward with them all, sometimes it's very hard to stop it. Yeah. So sometimes you've got to pull out players if that happens and kind of start bringing it to a numbers game. So splitting it as much as you can. But it's difficult. Urgency and er getting in early defending it helps a lot. One of the reasons I want to ask you about that, and I, I'm not watching <clears throat> Top 14 every week to know if this is a part of Larishel's personality generally. I watch some of the highlight clips before uh, Ronan comes on but I did watch the Mall has always been a big strength for the last number of years they didn't I'm not going to say they didn't compete in any line out there might have been one but at any area of the pitch at any given time they did not go up with Exeter's line out they stayed and waited to attack it when it hit the ground and they're so powerful on the ground and they're so aggressive um, and obviously if you can get someone like Will Skelton he can nearly kind of twist and turn mm. a mall on his own and he gets in there it's hard to stop him so um, well, they have a lot of power Leinster, do you think? Is that a I don't think they'll be throwing players in the air they will contest in some for sure but you think the, the, the reason for contesting is really believing that you can yeah you, you, there's a real good chance and if you have someone like Paul O'Connell who's moving up and down and he's mm. so shrewd and you're not really sure as an opposition is he going to go up in front of you or behind you? Is he going to move? That kind of puts doubt in the line-out callers. Whereas if you're staying down, you know that what's coming. So Len Leinster, I don't, I Leinster will, what they've done this a uh, lot is is taking the ball off the top and little plays around the back of the line-out, the front of the line-out, Dan Sheehan powering around, hitting someone in midfield. So there's a lot of strategies there, but... There may be a couple of times where they just go man up and roll the sleeves up and Leinster win the line and they try and maul it because they have a very, very good maul as well. And if Leinster gets set very early, it doesn't really matter um, 
and the ball is 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 long. The mall is long. Well, it's a great chance that Leinster will score from a mall, but it's difficult when you're against a very big side like that who are good at defending it. But Leinster's mall defence has been very good as well this year. We uh, we often talk about home advantage, Quinny, like it, in almost cliched terms, like a, oh, it's a two point advantage or whatever else. James Tracy was very interesting during the week talking about how it genuinely can make a difference. If you're the away team, there's almost like a cloud that comes over you when you feel like the, the atmosphere is building up against you. I saw Leinster were uh, calling on fans to, to get into the stadium early tomorrow as well this week. Um, how big an advantage could that possibly be? It's big. If you if you need um, lift and support, particularly, I always think for myself, it's it's when you're hanging on. When mm. you're on, when you're defending for a long period and somebody comes up with a big tackle or a big turnover, it's incredible. You really feel that energy and it kind of can give you a lift. It can give you an adrenaline rush, but um, plus you're in familiar territory, you yeah. know, and... Um, a little bit of negativity or doubt seeps into the opposition that this is going to be the inevitable scenario because the crowd are all over you and all that stuff and you know it's hard and mm. it's it's the intrigue of sports psychology isn't it right yeah. across the board Shane because you know it happens in sport all the time anecdotally this week the Munster fans that you've spoken to are they are they behind Raj and La Rochelle or are they there's supporting their Leinster there's a mix um, and I think Leinster winning this game is brilliant for Irish rugby in a sense that we have a World Cup coming up. Um, we want that momentum going forward into summer camps. And I think, look, it's... Without being naive here, look, Munster, Leinster are Munster's biggest rivals. It's probably not the same as it was the last number of years because Leinster will be ultra-dominant. Ultra um, and I think I meet a lot of Leinster people say that I was there in 06 and 08 cheering you guys on and for Munster and I wish the Munster fans would do the same there's plenty of Munster fans who will, will cheer Leinster on and want Leinster to win there's plenty of Munster fans who will want La Rochelle to win and I'm fine with either I think it's good for Lens, for Irish rugby if Leinster win I got tweeted by a guy called John O'Donnell I'm sure he's a very nice fella he's a Leinster fan and he was saying why don't I if I say Munster winning a trophy last weekend, if they win the URC, is great for Irish rugby. Why won't I say that? Fair point, John. It is. And Leinster winning this week is really good for Irish yeah. rugby. And I think, unless you have some sort of an allegiance to Raj, um, yeah, you should, look, you should look. Unless you were one of his best yeah, mates. I'm like, keeping, uh, keeping myself Pascal, out of this. Pascal Jacob asks the most pertinent question of the morning on YouTube as we wrap here. Who's Quinny supporting? I'm 50-50 on this one. And that's being honest. And I really will walk out of the stadium tomorrow. I'll be, I, I'm very close to Ronan. I'm godfather to one of his children, Max. Um, I played with him for so long. And from a personal point of view, yes, I'd love him to have that joy. He, ha he had it last year, though, and I'm kind of saying to him, yeah, you'll be grand. Enough enough. You had it last year, the big celebration. Um, Leinster, on the other hand, it's brilliant for Irish rugby if they win because I, I want Ireland to do incredibly well. And I do want Leinster to do well tomorrow, so I'm yeah. kind of split. Mm. But I think if you're if you're not, I think Munster. If you, if people who have not are not an allegiance to rugby clubs and are passionate and haven't experienced any sort of a kind of slagging or abuse over the years, they should support Leinster. Yes, they should, and we should support the Irish teams. But. Um, so yeah, go out and support Leinster tomorrow if you uh, if you uh, if <laughs> you're not close to Ron uh, O'Gar, the Cork people will kill me. Um, has his tongue in cheek. But look, I you know, it's it's going to be <laughs> an do. incredible game. It's going to be a game that um, it's hard to call. Leinster are in the driving seat here, and I think Leinster will win the game, and it will be good for Irish rugby when they do so. Wow, score prediction, Quinny. Uh, it's hard. Um, it's going to be tight, I'd say, and it's going to be serious, a serious um, challenge for Leinster because they're going to be physically test, test, tested. It was last year 24-21? Um, seven or eight points to Leinster. Right. Ronan won't mind me saying that. He'll be probably happy that I'm talking up Leinster, but look... <laughs> It's not patronising. Just look at the, what what they did throughout the whole pool stages and the knockout stages. They've been at a different level. That's not to say that La Rochelle can't win this game. They're a very, very capable side here. Um, so who knows? All right. Well, uh, you're on commentary duty for us. Yes. This game, so you'll be impartial anyway, no matter what happens. Mm. 
James Tracy, I just have to keep him in check, you know, to make sure <laughs> he's... That is in itself worth tuning to in. To make sure he's not going wee, wee, wee. I'll have to say, James, now that you're in the big bad world of, of the media stuff, you have to say they. Leinster or they or, yeah. you know... Right. Thanks, William. Enjoy Cheers, the games. Man. Thanks a lot. Alan Quinlan there. As always, 18 minutes past eight. Loads of comments coming in about the rugby. We'll reverse back into those a little bit later on. But before all that, time to turn to the football. Jilly Flaherty, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for your uh, patience hanging on there. We had a bit of a slow start out of the blocks this morning, uh, technically, so we're a little bit behind time. Thanks, Billy, for hanging on. Um, crunch time, obviously, in the WSL this weekend. Um, it's a shootout between uh, Chelsea, 52 points, United, two points behind them, and then five points adrift are Arsenal, who Chelsea will meet uh, on Sunday in the uh, lunchtime kickoff. And a uh, big opportunity for Chelsea to get it done this weekend, will they? Well... Uh... Well, it's going to be difficult, you know. I think this weekend, this um, I think in the whole of the WSL, with the games at the top and the games at the bottom, um, people were kind of hoping that this was going to be the last weekend of the season because it's obviously you've got Chelsea versus Arsenal, you've got Man United versus Man City, um, then obviously at the bottom you've got Tottenham versus Reading, uh, Leicester around with West Ham. So there's all sort of going on, but. I mean, if Arsenal win, then obviously they go to 50 points, only two points off of Chelsea um, with one game left to play. Um, I think if Chelsea get it done, then I think that's them done because they've got red in their last game of the season, which I can't see an upset happening there. So I think if Chelsea can get a result on the weekend, then yes. I mean, for me, I, I've always said that I think they were the favourites anyway to, to win this year. They've just got, even in the position that they was in, where they needed to win the games in hand, if any team wants that pressure and that responsibility, it's Chelsea to do the business, which they have done so far. Is there a sense of inevitability inevitability about Chelsea, Jilly? Uh, because I know I think you said in the Counter Press podcast that you you almost turned off the the FA Cup final before the before the Chelsea goal last week. Like there, there is this feeling that that they will continue to get the job done. Yeah, I mean, I need <laughs> I need to off oh, because it was so boring. Yeah, um, well, that too, yeah. And I yeah, and I was like, if I, I mean, I. I I want to watch football anyway, but I mean, I was obviously talking about it the next day. So it was sort of, I think it was hard not being there as well, you know, not in the atmosphere and that. But yeah, I do think even with Chelsea, they've always got this mentality where it's, I don't really think they've played particularly well all year, really. Um, but they've found a way to get results and that's what winners do. You know, Peniel Harder's back and I mean, someone mentioned in um during the week that well last week that they don't think Peniel Hard has really been a miss for Chelsea and I'm like you're mad because you look at the impact that she's had in the last few games coming on and then starting against West Ham like she's been huge for them into this la- latest run up um, I think it'd have been nicer for Chelsea to see her coming back a little bit earlier because she could have had an impact more so in the games against Barcelona um, but yeah I do think she's been huge for them but and they've they, they just got this mentality. They've just got this mentality. They know how to win and they find a way, whatever it means. And even the comments from Emma Hayes, I think we spoke briefly about it last week, that she, she referenced the fact that they needed to be more clinical and that they certainly have started to be more clinical in recent weeks. Is that because Pernilla Harder is back in the team? Yeah, well, I mean, they Emma's always like that. She's She'll never come out and just say she's happy with where they are. Um, she always pushes the team and and the, the squad and the staff for more. Um, but I think you're looking at, obviously, the, the two games that Chelsea had in hand um, were, well, one of them was Everton and the other one was, well, there was three, Everton, Leicester and West Ham. So when they're looking at that and they knew that the goal difference um, of them and Man United was quite a big goal, um, they took maximum um, effort in those games to get the results that they needed and they put a lot of goals um, on the board, you know, so they made up that goal difference and obviously she's come out and said, goal, it could go down to goal difference this year, um, but goal difference is huge, it's like an extra point, so they had, they would have had a target in those games and they were clinical, like in the uh, Chelsea-Everton game, I think in the second half, Lauren James had a shot on target, which was the first shot on target that Chelsea had had that were, wasn't a goal. You know, and that's a crazy stat because I think they'd had like, that was the sixth shot on target and five of them had gone in and it was only just in the second half. Like, they had this ruthlessness about them, say midweek, obviously against Leicester, Everton, and then obviously West Ham as well, um, where they would have had a target and said, listen, 
these are these are the games we can rack up the goal difference here. And they went and got one and they didn't stop. They went and got the ball out of the net and they went again. And yeah, they were so clinical in the last few games. That uh, that game for Arsenal, I guess, look, they, they can still have an outside chance of, of lifting the title this season. But it's it's Champions League football, really, Julie, for them, is it? That has to be the, the, the main focus. So top three finish guarantees them a seat at uh, Europe's top table for, for next season. Uh, they're probably hoping Man City don't win at United on Sunday to, to maybe help, help them out. I know City are kind of uh, breathing out their necks. But uh, quite a remarkable achievement for, for Jonas Eideval and that Arsenal side, given all the injuries that they've had to deal with this season. Yeah, and I, I think they'll they'll snatch Champions League from anyone's hands if they if. Do you know what I mean with with the season that they've had? Um, obviously, they've won the Continental Cup against against Chelsea. You know where they were probably going into that game underdogs. Mm. They won the Continental Cup. Um, obviously, they have done so well in the Champions League and probably kicking themselves because they should be looking forward to a Champions League final. Um, and they've had so many injuries, you know, they've, they've lost so many key players this year. So for them to come away and say, listen, we've won a trophy and we've we've qualified for the Champions uh, for the Champions League again for next season with the injuries that they've got, that's huge for the club. Um, and I think they've had obviously a couple of results. Um, I think the, the game against Man City, Katie McCabe scored the winner. I think for them, that was like a turning point. I think for them, it was sort of, We've, we've got this belief now that we can get back into um, into games and that we can get the result. But yeah, I think if Jonas Seidelberg will be honest, I think at the end of the season for them, if you said, right, we're going to lose Mead and Mar, we're going to lose Mead, we're going to lose the Williamson, we're going to lose Kim Little, um, Caitlin Fall is going to be out for a for period of time, but we're still going to get a Continental Cup and we're still going to qualify for Champions League. Would you take it? I think million percent every person at that club would say yes. Mm. We saw the the challenge midweek as well on on Leo Valti by uh, Aggie Beaver Jones led to a red card. Eventually, I think the the referee uh, eventually chatting to to our assistant referee led to that decision. And and look, Beaver Jones was was clearly distraught going off the pitch as well, and um, a young player too, so difficult for her. But I know since you retired, Jilly, you've been quite vocal about the referee referees generally in the league and their and their sometimes bad decisions and bad officiating. Um, what do you feel about that now? Because there, there seem to be plenty of untouched incidents. I'm not talking about that incident during the week, but generally speaking in the WSL, there seem to be incidents that crop up every now and again. Yeah, I mean, I think that decision in the week was the correct decision. Mm. Um, I don't think there, there wasn't there wasn't any intent for Maggie Beaver-Jones to be malicious. I think the ball just ran away from her. She's done a last um, lunge, sort of a last kick lunge, and has obviously caught Walty... Um, and obviously she was in a lot of pain. Maybe if if Walty wasn't injured and was able to get back up again, then maybe it would have just stayed a yellow. But I think obviously she was down and it was a serious injury and everything. And then they obviously reviewed it. Um, but yeah, she made the right um, she made the right decision regarding that. But I do I do think I, I've always I'll, I will support a ref when a ref, when I was playing. I would support a ref when they were doing well or they had a good communication because obviously where I was captain as well and they had good communication, um, you like that as a player. But I think there's been some decisions. There was a decision for Chelsea Everton. Um, it's a clear stonewall penalty against Lauren James and they play it out for a corner. Um, it, it's, it's ridiculous. But I, do, I think it's hard. And I've always said this from when I was playing, I've always said you've got full-time players but you don't have full-time referees. Mm. Like you're, you're giving a professional player now the, the environment for them to be the best of the best and the best that they can be, and they're full-time professionals. And then you're asking referees to be a professional, but also work during the week and then do the referee training. Like I've always said this, and I said this when I was playing, that referees, they should you should give the same support to referees and you should make them professional because you, you've got a professional league and you've got professional players, and then we've... We've not given the referees the same standard and the same training and the same levels of expectations what we do the players. I'm curious, did, did the quality of refereeing, uh, in your view, ch- uh, get better as your career progressed in the WSL or did it consistently stay at a level? Oh, I do, I do think it's got better. Um, but I do think, it's like anything, I think you talk about the men's football, you was able to get away with a lot more than when I was playing when I was younger than what you would now. There are obviously a lot more um, eyes on the game and 
even things like dissent and that, like you would be able to get away with saying stuff when you was uh, when I was younger than now. But I think when there's more eyes on the game now, um, obviously that level's gone up. The professional professionalism level's gone up as well from players. So the referees have to come along with that. I still just think we need to support refs more. Like I'm, I'm not a ref hater. Like <laughs> do you know what I mean? I know it's a very difficult job, and I wouldn't want to be a referee myself. But I just think. We need to give referees the same support, the same funding, the same opportunity to be full-time referees and committed to the game as we do the professional players. In some of our uh, national sports here, Jilly, the women's game or Gaelic football have sort of taken the lead on various innovations around shot clocks and stuff like that or, or in-game active clocks and a hooter at full-time, various little innovations. Um, obviously, the comparisons often come up between football, the respect for referees in football versus rugby, for example. Is there an opportunity for the women's game to take the lead around any of that stuff, like miking up refs or anything that might help them? We, we all accept that as a culture needs changing generally in football. Um, it feels like at some point we're going to end up having mics and that's going to end up in a better experience for everybody and more respect for the referee. Is that something women's football could take the lead on? Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. I mean, I like it when I watch the rugby and you can hear, when you're watching it, you can hear the referee and their explanations of why they're doing something and their reasonings. But what I feel like, obviously I was captain for four years at West Ham and before the game, you'd always get into a it'd sort of be a, a huddle with, like before you got all dressed and that, you'd have a huddle and it'd be like the two general managers, the two captains, um, they do the team sheet and then there's the referees there. And the referees would say the same talk to the players. So they'd say like, um, right, look, listen, I'm, I'm going to let you play the game today. Like be on my, like, so obviously support me. Uh, if I pull you in, I'm doing it so that um, I don't give your player a booking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So there always used to be this chat where you'd be like, right, we're going to be open with each other. And then there would be 95% of the time you'd get on the pitch and something would happen. And I would say, ref, and they'd go, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me. And I'm like, but I'm, I'm the captain and I'm asking you a question. And it'd be, don't talk to me. And it's just sort of like, I, I got to the point where I was saying to players in the changing room, like, why do I need to go out and do this team huddle talk with the refs mm. when you get on the pitch and you cross the white line and it's completely different? It's not that, especially as a captain, you think that there should be that relationship. And there's some really good refs who I would play with over my time who would go like, Ginny, this is why I'm doing this, this and this. And I'd go, OK, that's fine. And then I can play that back to the players. So there needs to be that, I think, that openness more of, players and referees are not working against each other they should be working with each other you know and there needs to be that relationship but I think sometimes players don't have an opinion about a ref and they get their backs up when the referee is sort of like that back towards them as in no I'm not talking to you go away um, I know players are not uh, right 100% of the time and I know that players can be a pain you see I don't like players when they surround a referee and they all scream and shame but it should be there should be that relationship with a captain or a player on that team where they can talk to the referee and sort of be a sounding board and, and be able to have that relationship on a pitch. A uh, referee could be busy in the Manchester derby on, on Sunday evening. Jilly, 6.45 kickoff for that, this one, United against City. Um, and from United's perspective, I guess they, they need a win and they need to beat Liverpool, of course, in the, in the last day. But uh, a big win over City would, would certainly help in the event of Chelsea and Arsenal drawing. So if United were to win by five or more goals over City, that would mean they go into the final game of the season, top of the table, which would be a massive, massive uh, relief. But, uh, of course, that's a, an unlikely prospect. Um, i interested to get your thoughts as well on, on Mark Skinner in the uh, after the FA Cup final. He threw his FA Cup runners-up medal on the ground. Um, what were your thoughts on that? Like, is it is it a, a little bit disrespectful? Is it just him in the heat of the moment showing how much it means to him? No, I, I think it's disrespectful. Um, I said that as well on the the, the, the podcast earlier in the week. That I mean, I, I've played in. I mean, you're talking about FA Cup finals. I played in ten FA Cup finals and I lost three of them, and not once did I chuck my medal on the ground. You know, that's a it's a it's a hard slog to get to an FA Cup final. And and I, I said in the, in the week, Mark Skinner's not a serial winner. Like he's not been in the FA Cup final consistently for the last ten years. So what gives you the right to chuck a medal on the floor of a competition where you've had no success really in it? Um, that was my um, fault because I thought, I, I mean, I love the FA Cup. I love it and it is my favourite competition and it's one that holds really good memories for me. But yeah, I, I do see it as disrespectful. Um, 
And, and I think he should be, if that's a player doing that, I mean, that player probably would have been dragged in and said, listen, you don't, you don't disrespect like that. So for me, he should be setting the standard for that. And yeah, I, I mean, whether it's, whether it's, um, it's just gutted and it's that emotion, but as a manager, you need to control that better. And you need to remember that, especially on an, on an FA Cup final at Wembley, where there's a sellout crowd, there's a lot of eyes on you. Um, if you want to go in the change room, chuck it around the change room, then that's up to you. But I think in front of everybody, when everyone's watching, and there's so many eyes in the game there, you can't be doing stuff like that. Yeah, it was certainly a, certainly a strange look. Um, so just to remind people of the fixtures, Tottenham Reading tomorrow at uh, quarter past four, remainder of the games then on uh, Sunday. So Chelsea Arsenal, as we said, half past 12 on Sunday, Everton Brighton at uh, one o'clock, it's Villa versus Liverpool from two, Leicester against West Ham at three, and then as he said, Manchester United taking on Manchester City from, from 6.45. What are your predictions, Chile, for the, for the two big ones, I suppose, Chelsea Arsenal and United City? Um, I mean, I can see a Chelsea win. Um, I just think they've just got too much in the tank now. Um, for Arsenal, I think yeah, I see a Chelsea win. I w- I wouldn't like to see a Man City win because I do, I do want Arsenal to get into the Champions League. But um, you probably would say a Man United win, so that it's exciting going into the last game of the season, which I sort of have to see it now as a neutral. So um, I'll go Chelsea win, Man United win. All right, we look forward to it, and we'll catch up with you next week. Thanks, William Jelly. See you later. Thanks a lot. Uh, Judy Flaherty on the line there discussing all things WSL. Uh, up next, we're going to be joined live in studio by uh, former Irish women's boxer Deirdre Gogarty. Obviously, a major weekend for boxing here in Dublin. Uh, before all of that, Shabana Hearn was on with Nathan last night talking about uh, the Chelsea manager, Emma Hayes. Uh, the fact as well that they go, they beat Manchester United in the cup final last weekend, beat West Ham 4 0 last night. And Emma Hayes is able to make seven changes, rest a lot of key players, and still be that dominant. Mm-hmm. It just—it's a testament to to how Chelsea, I think, operate um, and how Emma Hayes operates. She is the best. She is the most ruth- most ruthless. I mean, when today I was looking at the video of um, Ericsson, Magdalena Ericsson, in floods of tears, giving her a goodbye message to Chelsea, I was like, "Huh? If you're that happy and you've had..." the best time in your life. What is it then about Chelsea since she's been there since 2017? Why now are you moving on? And I do think you've got to look at the best managers in the world of all times. They're always improving when they're at their best. And is Emma Hayes looking to change up that squad now again this summer? Pernella Harder coming back from injury is is undroppable. She, she's the reason they won the FA Cup. She's the reason that, they, that you know, um, Chelsea were able to do it against Manchester United last week in the FA Cup. And I think she'll be she will be missed um, as well. So will Ericsson, she's their captain, leaving the club. Millie Bright, she's still not then back from that injury. I I, I am keen to see what more business Emma Hayes is going to do this summer. Yeah, we shall see. Uh, maybe one of those will be uh, Katie McCabe. We'll see how that uh, works out over the next few months. It's 25 to 9. You're watching OTBM. We're delighted to have you uh, with us this morning. Loads of comments coming in about the rugby and the football. We'll bring those to you a little bit later on. But before all of that, a major weekend for Irish boxing. Uh, Katie Taylor obviously in action uh, tomorrow night. And we are delighted to say that we're joined in studio by the first Irish uh, woman to win a world boxing title. And she's brought the belt with her as well. Deirdre Gogarty, good morning to you. Good morning. It's great to be here. Thanks a million for coming in. It's such a pleasure to have you in. We've been sort of picking up bits of your story around. You've been in the country, back in the country, I think, for a few days. Yes, yeah, since, uh, yeah, a couple of days ago. Have you enjoyed reliving your story, uh, telling yeah. your story? Ah, uh, yeah, it's great. The buzz around Katie's fight and um, the enthusiasm. And um, it's really been wonderful. It's like a second homecoming for me. Mm. It's, in fact, it's almost bigger than my first homecoming after I won the world title yeah which you might come back to in a few minutes what um, what is your so you're, you're based in the US now right yeah I've been there for oh, 28 years now I can hear the accent over yeah I know the, it's the all, mi- all muddled bit. up <laughs> <laughs> you're, uh, the, mead, the mead has been knocked out of you yeah it, it, quite a bit yeah. whereabouts in mead are you from I'm from Mornington okay. just outside Drogheda okay so can you can we reverse back almost to the very start and just your relationship with boxing? So your story has come up this week in the context of Katie and what an idol um, that you were and a role model um, for her at that time. And again, we'll talk about that maybe in a little bit. But um, boxing and your roots in Meath and your family were not necessarily pushing you in that direction. Uh, 
No, not at all. My uh, parents were dentists and um, I was the youngest of seven children and all my older siblings were, you know, professionals and getting very uh, normal jobs and successful careers. And um, I was a bit lost. I did very poorly in school and I just fell in love with boxing. Um, it just totally captured my imagination. And when I saw Barry McGuigan win the world title and lift that belt, that was my dream. I wanted to be like Barry McGuigan. Mm. That's one thing, because I did that a lot as a kid, go, I'd like to be John Mackin. <laughs> yeah. And it was a whole uh, different ball game when it came to actually going to do that thing so particularly right. in an environment where like was there boxing in your family or was that none was it literally, whatsoever right? I mean nobody even liked boxing wow. I didn't know anybody that liked or knew anything about boxing what age were you when Barry McGuigan um, I was 15 15 and so you had had no sort of awareness or relationship with boxing at all well like I had started really being drawn to boxing around 12 I saw a clip of Jack Dempsey and it really okay. captured me and because I'd got bullied a lot in school so uh, when I saw that he would fight people much bigger than him I was like wow that's amazing so uh, I really was captivated by by learning the skills to be so good that you could beat someone 40 pounds every year or something. So um, in a way, I kind of went into boxing very naive about that. I just felt you just fight anybody, anywhere. And that's the approach I had to my career. Yeah, I had read somewhere, Deirdre, that you, you, so you say you're, you're discouraged from taking part in boxing, but your mother and your parents, were they keen to get you involved in other sports? Or Yeah, my mother tried to get me into golf. And um, I just remember the first time she brought me out to Baltray Golf Course and I was listening to you 2 on the headphones and all I could think about was, God, that would be a great song for a ring walk. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you can't fall in love with uh, golf at Baltray, I think that's it. You're yeah, I'm definitely find, not find a golfer. <laughs> so how did that manifest itself then, Deirdre? Like, what are you doing when, so you see Jack Dempsey fighting and you've got the context of what's going on in your life. Yeah. Are you out the back in the garage, sort of, how does that, Literally, set, so. uh, I, I got a uh, punch bag, I got an old sailor's kit and I stuffed it with newspapers and I hung it in the cup in the closet and the cupboard and uh, I would go in there and just punch away on it and fantasize about all these great fights I'd be in and win by knockout. And, mm. you know, I had no clue what I was doing. I was just learning, trying to learn out of just reading about other boxers. Yeah, because there's no woman at that point that no. you can look up to to go, that's my path. Right, yeah. I mean, I just was. I just wanted to be a great boxer. It didn't matter that I was a female. I mean, I just. It wasn't about being a great female boxer. I just wanted to be a great boxer. Yeah. I wanted to be like Barry. I think at seventeen was it then, Deirdre? You, you, you travelled from East to Dublin to link up with Pat McCormick, great trainer. Well, I was actually nineteen right. when. Uh, yeah, I was. All, I was in Drogheda Boxing Club for two years, and um, I was working uh, in Dublin on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And um, so um, the house I lived in was sold, and I was really worried about leaving the Drogheda Boxing Club because there was a big issue with girls being uh, even allowed to even spectate in a boxing club because they didn't want girls distracting the boys. So I said, gosh, I don't know if a boxing club in Dublin will even take me in. So that That's, was very risky. It's bonkers how, yeah. uh, how recently that is, that that, yeah. that was the opinion of people. Yeah, and I, I, I'd witnessed girls getting kicked out of clubs, but not because they were trying to train, just because they were trying to eye the boys, you know. So I kind of had to really prove, no, I'm really here up for box. I love boxing and I want to be a boxer. Your first pro fight in Ireland then is, is your only pro fight, in fact, as it turned out in Ireland. Well, it wasn't was... even pro. It was an unsanctioned on the undercard of a kickboxing match. Right. So this is 1991. Mm -hmm. So yes. who, who is this against and how, did this, how does this fight materialise? Well, I went on the Pat Kenny show pleading for a fight and um, a listener got word to um, PJ Bennis, who was Anne-Marie Griffin's trainer, and he, you know, suggested you want to try boxing. So luckily she did and we got in and, and had a fight and it was supposed to be an exhibition but they uh, announced a decision at the end and I was delighted because I won the fight different weight classes or was it no was we were similar? very similar weight in fact it was one of the few fights I had where it was really in my own weight class so um so that was great and I really thought we put on such a good show that it would kind of legitimize women's boxing in Ireland and I didn't think it'd be that long to where I'd be you know fighting legitimately and it wouldn't be banned anymore but of course it turned out to be my only fight in Ireland. 
Um, do you mind if I reverse slightly, Deirdre, in your story to a point that you mentioned earlier in relation to why you get into it and watching Jack Dempsey and thinking, you know, I'm... Um, you've mentioned about bullying in school. I think there'll be a lot of people watching and listening this morning who'll be familiar with that story about getting into combat sports on whatever level for that reason. Um, did that help you work through that? Did it help you, like, in a mental space to be able to take out some aggression in that regard? Did it mm-hmm. literally help you in, in any regard? Or how did that Oh, yeah. Out? I mean, getting into boxing, you know, when you're in a ring and someone's trying to take your head off, you have to be in the moment 110%. So... You know, boxing took me into a whole nother world where uh, instead of, you know, trying to be ladylike and respectable and considerate of others, I could just totally switch my personality and go in the seek and destroy mode. And uh, I love that. I love the freedom of just um, having this killer instinct and just getting in the ring. And um, I, I built my career on, I always wanted to be a finisher. I wanted to end every fight early. Mm. So... um the, just the thrill of that. And I think when you start doing a sport, a combat sport, people, uh, bullies sense that you know something, they sense a difference in your confidence level. And you may not even have to use it. It's just the fact you know how to use it. It's like a bully can pick up on that. So um, I noticed they started backing off. Really? Yeah. Really quickly, sort of after you'd... Yeah, absolutely. Got together and yeah. there was a bit more of a confidence about you. Yeah, definitely. And I, I had a, an older girl, a, a big, much bigger girl in school, and she would uh, bully me verbally a lot and sometimes physically, even when I was uh, in um, senior school. And she was walking past the house one day and they came in. I was punching the bag in my dad's old surgery. He had left the surgery empty and there was a glass door in the front and they saw me. So they came in and I didn't particularly like this girl, but when she came in and she saw me hitting the bag, she said, oh, you can really punch. And after that, she never bothered me again. (laughs) You know, I mean, it's not like I would walk up and punch her in the face or something, but... You know, it's just amazing uh, when people see you can do something like that, how they back off. Yeah. She, the, the knowing that you could do that probably helped her go. Okay, yeah, actually, she's not the one to pick yeah, on anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, you mentioned about the, the fight in Limerick and your, your only, it turned out to be your only ever fight in Ireland. I think it took four yeah. years for it to get, come together. You couldn't have imagined that that would only be your only ever fight in Ireland. No, no, not at all. And I mean, I, I especially once I'd won the world title, I just thought it was just natural that I would get to fight in Ireland. I mean, my plan was that I would end my career with a fight in Ireland. And um, so it, that was another heartbreaking part of my career that I never got to do that. Um, women, I won the title in 97 and it was a allowed for women to box in Ireland in 2001. But by then I had a really bad shoulder injury. Um, so I was still trying to fight even with that and I'd applied for a license and I'm still waiting to this day to get my uh, a license <laughs> application approved. It never came me. in. <laughs> no way. Yeah, I never got a response to it. Wow, that's remarkable. Um, where does the Katie story kick in? Well, I met Katie when she was very young. Um, she came out to the house and... She was, you know, asking all about boxing and how would she get a fight. And she, at that time, she was in the same boat where she couldn't get fights. And um, I was just telling her, you know, keep at it and showing your skills and they're going to have to let you fight. People are going to start saying, OK, why is this girl not fighting? Look how good she is. And so I just encouraged her to stay with it. And then I got a letter from her uh, after I fought Christy Martin. It was before I won the world title. And, um, that I was said, in the U.S.? Was that, was that, yeah, yeah, I was in the. I said, "Oh, great, she's still at it, you know." And so she, um, she, it wasn't a one-off meeting with a kid that you thought, "I better give her some encouragement and then let her on her way." But I mean, ultimately, you know, it'll just be a story mm. of a kid taking up a bit of boxing and being okay at it. <laughs> and that'll be the end of that. Yeah, I mean, you know, she could have done so many other sports. So I was just delighted to see she was still trying, you know, because once uh, you set the ball rolling, somebody's got to pick it up after that or it's just going to stop rolling. So when she sent a letter, and I'll always remember she said in the letter, I can't see boxing for girls taking off here in the uh, near future. I can see why you had to go away, and maybe one day they'll let us box in the Olympics. (sighs) Wow. What so a letter. Do you still just, have that? Oh, of course. I wow, treasure that letter. in a frame letter. somewhere. Yeah, it's, oh, yeah. It's, God, what a yeah. prophetic uh, prophetic line. Oh, I know. And, um, 
you know, it, I'm just uh, delighted she stuck with it. And uh, she's such a great athlete in person. I mean, you know, she's a dream come true, really, isn't she? You, um, you'll be obviously at, you'll be at the fight tomorrow night. Oh, definitely, yeah. Yeah, cheering yeah. her on. Um, you dropped in unexpectedly on her yesterday, is that right? Yes, yeah, it was great. Yeah, she was very surprised. So um, it was lovely just to, I just, uh, you know, I just remember looking at her face to face, just thinking about when she was so young and she had that fire and ambition. She was very quiet like me, but I could just uh, see that drive in her. There was a return letter as well, dear. It was a couple, earlier this year, I think. I know you'd written a return yeah. letter to her, and it was read out to her at a at a press conference. And one of the lines was beautiful. She, you said to her, "When I when I opened the door for Irish women in professional boxing, it wouldn't have meant anything if you didn't run through it." And you could see the emotion from from right. Katie when she heard that that line. Like it clearly meant so much to her to hear from you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's so true. It's like a full circle. You know, I think when I won the world title, I don't think people appreciated just what an accomplishment because they don't see the fights you've had outside the ring. It was, you know, we all, fighters want to fight in the ring, but there was many, many battles outside the ring that were much harder. And um, I think now people can see the big picture. I always knew women's boxing could be where it is now. I knew there'd be someone like Katie. If it wasn't her that stayed with it, somebody would come along. And so I'm not surprised, but now people can see the full picture. So I'm getting more appreciation now in a way I know, because of her. Of course. I, I know Katie has and will continue to be recognized in Bray. I, there, there's a, a petition and certainly an ongoing effort to get a, a statue of yourself. Yes, in, in yeah, I'm thrilled about that. Where's that at the moment, that process? Yeah, well, they're, they're, we have a fundraiser tonight and hopefully we'll get some funds coming in. And I mean, the statue, they're going to show the pictures of the statue tonight of how it's how it's going to look and everything. And I think, um, I mean, to me, it's the ultimate recognition. I, up to this point, the only recognition I have in the whole country is the Epic Museum in Dublin, and that is it. So um, this is uh, really going to be my symbol of uh, national recognition. I'm thrilled about it. It's very healing for me to get that type of recognition. Which seems insane that it's only taken until now because you mentioned the Christy Martin fight. Like that was on the undercard of Mike Tyson and Frank Bruno in 86. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah. I don't know, there's over a million people watching, watching yeah. that night's events. Yeah. Um, an unbelievable six round fight you had with her. Uh, am I right in saying you were booed, both booed onto the Yeah, into the going arena. into the ring, yes, we were booed. A different reaction after the fight. Oh, I'm sure. totally. Yeah, I mean that's all the everybody talked about was our fight. Is that a career highlight, or do you have a? Um, particular I standard? mean, my career highlight, personally, of course, is winning the world title. But that's that's the fight everybody remembers. That's the one everybody saw. And I think for a fighter, no matter how great the fight is, if you lose, it's a failure. So for me personally, it was a failure because I felt I blew my big chance. But in the context of women's boxing, it was a victory. Uh, what's the Drada connection? So I um, grew up uh, just outside Drogheda okay. and um, my dad moved his uh, dental practice into Drogheda and okay. it was right across this parking lot from the Drogheda Amateur Boxing okay. Club. Wow. So I would study that club from his waiting room and it took me uh, ages to work up the courage to actually even approach the boxing club. And uh, so I chatted up the coach and convinced him that I was very knowledgeable and I think he just didn't know what to make of me. Yeah. So he said, well, you can come in and watch the lads train if you want. Mm -hmm. I think he just wanted to kind of Appease finish you, with me. Yeah, and of course I kept going back and kept going back. So he let me start training. Can I, you used a word there a second ago, healing, that uh, mm -hmm. jumped out for me, which suggests a brokenness somewhere along the line in terms of your story or your path. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, I mean, there's just so many heartbreaks, you know, so many setbacks. Uh, so many times when I thought, OK, we've got it made now, you know, boxing's, women's boxing is here now, it's arrived, we'll get the recognition and compensation that we should. And there was just so many letdowns and disappointments. And then, um, you know, I kind of feel my career, uh, I won the world title and then I got this terrible shoulder injury. So it was very anticlimactic. I didn't get paid for my world title fight, so I had to go back to the day job. So I didn't live a world champion life, you know, not that I expected to be rich or anything like that. But, uh, you know, there was just no money and um, it was just uh, just a lot of difficulty and it kind of... Um, 
not getting recognized in my own country yeah. too is difficult. So now with this decade and it's all coming back around and people are realizing what I accomplished, I find that very healing. You spoke about the not getting paid for your world title fight. Like you, you were promised, I think it was twelve and a half thousand US yes. dollars. Yeah, you that never, was a never, lot of money. So you never saw that money. Not a penny. Why? Uh, the the promoter didn't pay anybody. Nobody on the card got paid. So um, yeah, that was just. And it, it's you know wasn't about the money. Of course, I even said in the dressing room before the fight. Ironically, I told my sister, you know, if I had a choice of the money or the title, I wanted the title. You know, it's never about the money, but everybody's got bills to pay. Mm -hmm. So it made it very difficult because working full time job and trying to be a full time boxer just are very difficult. You should show people the belt for people who can't see it. Huh? <laughs> Jesus, it's heavy as well. <laughs> World super featherweight title belt. That's amazing. Uh, you've obviously looked after it in, in the intervening yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. I treasure that because it's uh, the symbol of all the blood, sweat and tears and sacrifice. I'm sure Katie takes inspiration from, from your story massively. Like, uh, mm -hmm. do, do you reckon she has a... Uh, you, you probably have kept very, very close eye on her career yeah, since for obvious fight, reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, does she have a tough opponent tomorrow night because Chantal uh, Cameron's come in under the radar a little bit yeah she she does but um, and I think you know Katie's such a high performer that's what she wanted I just feel Katie's so well rounded she, she's so um, good on her feet and she's faster I just feel she's the the superior boxer and she's um, got the mindset and the mental uh, discipline to pull it off We've really enjoyed uh, spending the last uh, 20 minutes or so in your company. You, uh, you said a little bit earlier on, and it was on the tip of my tongue to ask you about it, your um, personality seems very uh, similar to Katie. It was mm. hopping off for the first mm. 10 minutes. I was like, it's like <laughs> sitting down talking to Katie herself because she's very understated and very quiet. There's a lot of similarities between the two of you. Yeah, there was. In fact, the person, uh, Paddy Mulhall and Katie, brought him up uh, yesterday. He was a friend of ours. He was a massive boxing fan. And he was the one that started telling me about Katie. And he says, this young girl, she's just like you. She loves boxing, but she's so shy and quiet. She's just unbelievable how much she's like you. So it's just so amazing how it all turned out. Mm. Similarly, having spent uh, time in Katie's company, there's a similar sort of aura and um, presence off both of you as well. Mm. So um, we hope the healing is complete um, and mm -hmm. I know that I'm sure the last few days has probably helped a little bit with that oh absolutely and that um, that statue in Drada gets done yeah so, oh, that would be that would be the highlight of my career what did you have to say to Katie yesterday when you uh, when you met her well we just talked about old times you know I didn't talk about the fight to her because you know I know from being a fighter you get sick to the back teeth of talking about the fight for so um you know, because it's you know, sometimes you got to step away from it. But um, I just talked about just remembering as a young girl, it just seems like yesterday and how thrilled I am. She followed through. And like I said, it's it, it's um, coming back full circle to me. I wouldn't be getting this recognition now if it wasn't for what she's done. So in a way, I helped her. Now she's helping me. It's full circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, an absolute pleasure spending time in your company we'll catch up again mm. down the road thanks a million yeah thanks very much thank for you. having me thanks a lot cheers Deirdre Gogarty and um, as we said obviously Katie in action tomorrow night plenty of previews for the fight as well if you want to check out on our YouTube channel Eric Donovan and plenty more as well uh, looking ahead to the fight this weekend some highlights on the OTB Podcast Network today John Giles is up there Dan Levy in conversation with Nathan last night and uh, League of Ireland Match Day as well you can follow OTB across our socials and subscribe as well to the OTB Podcast Network after the ads David Brady He's going to preview Mayo against Kerry in the um, Sam Maguire opener and during the break here it'll be uh, a clip from this week's episode of The Hurling Pod James Gell, Paul Murphy and Will talking about uh, Davy Fitzgerald at Waterford and The Hurling Pod is with Borgosh Energy proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship and the Legends Tour Series uh, which takes place a brilliant series which takes place at Croke Park back after these You're listening to OTB AM, AM. Off the ball daily. I might create a new game. I looked at maybe creating a game that just has four pockets on it. I looked at a table, we started playing it. I went, you know what, I like this. It's a cross between Paul and Snooker. And you could win the first World Championship on a 6x6 six table? Yeah, I'd win it and yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> Ronnie sort of an inventor. Just inventor, to yeah. Subscribe to the Off The Ball Daily podcast feed right now. He gets it on the wing, but he, hit, he didn't hit a straight line pass to a straight line runner on the wing. I think it's to Ozzy Gleeson. Ozzy Gleeson gets the ball, turns, he looks in, there's no inside forward at all. So no inside forward. So he ultimately has to carry it down the line and that's the shot he hit in the 33rd minute inside the 14. 
So that that thing, yeah, that yeah. passage play proves two things. Number one, the system is broken. Number two, the personnel don't know how to utilize it or how to use it. And, and number three, it saps the energy out of them. So that that's what I was looking at through the, through the whole game. So then you're on about Murphy's on about shots there, like I'm play. So they I think I heard the manager say that they had 23 shots in the first half. Three of those resulted in points from play. Just three. So that's that's a, a horrific possession. So the system they have in place, again, just some more numbers overall. They've only got 11 players that have scored in the championship so far. Of those, four of them are non-starters. Only four players have scored in every game. That's including the free taker. So all those numbers, they all accumulate to say, you know, that's how analysis can actually tell you a pattern. So when you say 23 shots in the game in the first half, that's how sometimes analysis can actually distort figures. You know what I mean? Yeah. Them shots were coming from home <clears> there, <throat> out the wing, over the shoulder. They were all levels of ridiculousness. So the, the, the Watford game plan had no logic to it whatsoever. How can you adopt a system against, actually specifically, against a team with as much pace? Probably probably the most pace in the country is what Clare have. Mm-hmm. When you consider they have the midfield they have, they have far they have. So then you adopt a strategy that you poke the ball down when you've only got two backs inside your, your own half and then you leave Tony Kelly and Ian Galvin and these lads inside two on two. That is absolutely criminal. No logic. OCB. AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. It's nearly nine o'clock. You're welcome back to OTB AM. A uh, couple of quick comments before we get to David Brady. Uh, Richard Melia says, as a Leinster fan, I always supported Munster during their era. The match last week hurt me so much, losing to Munster probably more than losing to anyone else. But now I will shout for them in the URC. And Michael Buckley on the Champions Cup final. As a Munster fan, I want Leinster to win. I think it's better for Irish rugby if. Um, if La Rochelle win, I won't complain. I hope it's going to be a belter of a game. There you go. People, reason. People reason. on the fence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Reason set in. Huh. Uh, nine o'clock, David Brady. Good morning to you. DB, come on in. Gentlemen. How are you now? You're alive. Happy days. How are you getting on? Actually, loving life. Loving life. Um, Kerry Mayo this weekend. Like, we should be hugely excited. Um, about this game, it should be you know top billing across all the back pages. We should have spent four hours previewing it across the week. Um, but for all that, like even before it begins, it's kind of a dead rubber. Wouldn't one hundred percent agree with you, but um, I don't see it as a dead rubber. I see it as a very important match from both sets of teams because the one thing you want and the one thing you need and you strive on it is confidence. Um, regardless of the opposition that you're playing, are Jason. What happened there, boys? The gremlins have uh, the gremlins have set in. We'll come back to DB there in a second and get his thoughts on that. Kieran Shannon was writing about it in the Examiner during the week, saying it's a diminished affair. And like I, I uh, being a little bit provocative there, obviously in terms of my comments today. Well, that word jeopardy that Kieran Shannon I think used yeah. in that piece. Like it, I agree with you there. There, are, there is no jeopardy, but I still think. It's a, you know, there's only what ten weeks till the other final. If you're not, if they are, if either of these teams aren't performing now, then yeah. you're in trouble. DB, you're back. You got a, an episode of Ben and Holly there at full blast. <laughs> <laughs> Get enough of that. Get enough of that at home. Go on. The the jeopardy we're talking about here about this game. Yeah, and it, it is like, especially from a Mayo perspective. Um, you and it's very rare. And look, there has been probably times when the Super Eights were there that you lose two games in a row. But from a Mayo team on such a high coming off a National League win, National League champions, losing the following week to Roscommon, you're, you're searching for the last six weeks to just reset and get your confidence back and maybe put all that to one side. Now, again, you have Sunday or Saturday, 3 o'clock. Your confidence could be taken another dent. And I think it's very, very, very important that the way that Mayo go out and actually try and control this game, if you remember back to the start of the last time these sides met in Killarney, it was, what, 2019? There must have been 25 shoulders thrown before the ball was even thrown up. I remember distinctly going, wow, we're in for a serious game here now. But it ended up that, you know, that quarterfinal was a 10-point defeat for Mayo. I think the tempo and the way they control the game is vital. And take some lessons from the teams that have tried to, I suppose, control the tempo, and especially the Roscommon. Control the tempo, they had the ball, they didn't rush, they didn't panic, and uh, they kept control. I think that's what Mayo need to do, is just 
kind of be in this game and control it and be there towards the last 15. That jeopardy is the thing, David, that I'm that I'm wondering. Like, Mayo could technically, I was thinking about this last night, Mayo could technically lose three games in a row and still win the all Ireland Championship. They, could, they lost the, the Roscommon game. You could lose to Kerry this weekend. You could actually lose to Louth in Castlebar in the second game on, the, on that weekend, the 3rd and 4th of June, and then just beat Cork uh, in the last game at a neutral venue, progress by the skin of your teeth to a preliminary quarter final and, and progress from there. So I guess it says a lot about the current structure of the Championship that that can happen. Oh, it does. And I, I don't know who said it there last Sunday or whatever it was during the day and, and the Sunday game. Is, it's, it's the group of life. And that's what it is. And it, it is that <laughs> it is that thing you're going, oh, you know, when is it, is it really starting? People are saying the championship is starting proper. For a few teams, yes, it's do or die. It's, it's, if they don't win this game, they could be the ones that, you know, face that, that um, the, the, the fourth spot and, and, and exit in the, the championship. But it just, it, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in May. Um, it's over in two months' time. That's it. Done and dusted. Um, will will you t- tease that out for us, DB? Because I think that, like, the context, obviously, for Mayo here, and I have acknowledged my uh, provocative comment at the top, which I uh, recant and say that, like, it's a hugely important game, obviously, this week. But the, Mayo get beaten by his common. I believe they had a couple of weeks off. They come back into camp. They've sort of worked the anger out of themselves. I mean, I don't know if that's all positive that you want to maybe store some of that away to be able to unlock on a crucial point of the season. But just that dynamic of having the two weeks off, you're back in for a four-week block. And as you say, in 10 weeks' time, it's really quickly, uh, we'll know who the All-Ireland champions are. And if Mayo have a run, they'll be playing most of those games. Done and dusted. Yeah, Yeah. done and dusted. And they'll be playing the vast majority of those weeks. Wouldn't be overly, you know, I wouldn't read too much into an eight-point defeat or there, thereabouts from a challenge game last Friday night against uh, Kildare. It's, 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 the, tomorrow is, is very important from a Mayo perspective. And it's important from the Curry perspective as well. Um, they want to continue their momentum, their positivity. Um, what was it, 5 five fourteen to, to, to 15 points versus Clare? Very good, clinical performance, hungry, goal hungry. Um, and there's a few scenarios and situations that Kevin McStay will. As manager, nearly probably needs to hang his coat on now over the next um, the next few weeks, because if you start changing, you know, certain key structures in your team halfway through, that it, he needs to have confidence in saying the likes of for me Connor Loftus. Um, will will Connor remain from a centre back perspective? Because if more questions are asked of Connor now um, on Saturday and. It doesn't work as a sweeper. And a lot of the sweeper systems, or a lot of sweepers are let down by guys who are supposed to be there to be covering them or are handed over. It's um, it's hard to get right, but I think we all need to get that right. They need to get their half-back scenario and a half-forward scenario right. That's that's crucial. What are... Uh, Mayo are not quite full disciples of this awful lateral stuff that teams knock the ball around for 5, 10 minutes or more and uh, without really going anywhere they're held back obviously by the defensive D what um, the, Mayo don't mind getting it in that bit quicker at times have we seen the personality or the style of what we expect from this Kevin McStay Mayo to unfold over the coming months or will there be more tweaks do you think to come I think the, I think there will be more tweaks Adrian I think you're, you're kind of saying we haven't seen this lateral or over and back, and if you look at, I thought, I thought the Ulster final the last day was absolutely brilliant in every aspect of modern day football, of entertainment, of drama, of of tenacity, resilience, bite. It was, I thought, it had everything, but it was very much focused on keeping the ball, not giving away the ball, silly, not giving it away cheaply. And Mayo against Roscommon were, 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 were guilty of that in certain times and bringing it into the traffic and bringing it in around the D and looking to offload that one or two passes when your D was absolutely chaotic. It should have been out, recycled and with. At times, we, we don't have enough width on it from a Mayo perspective. It does get a little bit punched. And again, when you have Aidan O'Shea there, and Aidan is, is playing extremely well, extremely well from a full forward, from a target man perspective. Curry found it hard enough to handle him in the National League. I think it will be another um, go-to area for Mayo. But we need to keep with. We need to have our, our, our half-back and our half-forwards more dominant. 
if we're not, if, if, if our half back line or half forward line are not being more dominant than what they are, um, we may all will struggle. But it's going back to your team, your tweaks, what will have Gunny Buckley, Stephen Rockford and those over the last um, five weeks, Kevin McStay, and McHale brought to the, brought to the floor. You mentioned the the league game there between the two, David, and um, so that was the the two fourteen to one ten point win for for Mayo. That game was over by by half time. Let's be fair, two eight to three points, uh, the half time late around Donahue and James Carr getting the the goals for Mayo in that first half. And um, funny, we're talking this morning rugby and and whether Leinster will hold on to the the, the pain of the La Rochelle game last year when they're heading into the Champions Cup final tomorrow. A couple of the Kerry lads referenced that league game against Mayo. Um, you know, after the the win over Clare, and said that they're not lacking for motivation, that they remember that league game. Will that have any bearing whatsoever on 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 the on how the teams, I guess, fare at the weekend? The only bearing on it will be that we're not going to see that kind of performance or lackluster kind of um, setup from a Curry team because no. you know we all it it they were on the back of winning on Ireland. They were. You know, still only getting back into the stride from holidays and everything else. You know, that was the nineteenth of February. Now we're 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 it's three months, and three months is a long time in football. Long time to get the heads right because the bodies were there. It's all about the attitude and the mindset from the Curry perspective back then, and it's it's totally changed. Um, I suppose winning your monster championship gives you that degree of confidence, and unfortunately, from Body and David have had their 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 mother passing, um, and I think that's that's a unifying factor in a team as well, and that's a bond that um, is 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 existent in club football and and county football when you when you lose a loved one like that, that sense of togetherness becomes even more. Yeah, and no more than the challenge game you mentioned, I'm nearly reluctant to ask you for a prediction on the game because of its. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's totally meaningless, but um, you know, it's not going to be a deciding factor in either of the seasons. You think one solution to all that would be just to do away do away with the preliminary quarterfinals? I know there's like money to be made and all that, but if they went straight into a quarterfinal and actually just done away with two teams out of every group, that would actually put a bit of jeopardy into it. That's what you want. You want that bit of jeopardy. I, I'm, I'm not, and I, I look at it, if I if I hadn't uh, my, my nephew's um, communion, I'd be gone to it. But I do fear, I do fear that we're going to see a very, very much lacklustre attendance over the next few weeks. Yeah. Until until we, I think that is, and that's not making money on it. That's, no. I, I do think there is going to be that going, to, it's half empty. What's going on here? And it's, it's, I just feel it. I just feel it. And uh, it's, 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 the, the, the bonfire hasn't started. Um, but it, it, it is, it does, it is taken, GA people a certain amount of time to understand this championship are saying, when am I supposed to go all in or when is That's it, right. you know, to Heller to Connacht? And uh, it is that, it is, I'm looking forward to it. It's a massive game. It's great to have these games now consistently over the next few weeks. Yeah. But from my own perspective, it's important that they're there and they're in this game with until the last 15 minutes. Yeah. Regardless of the results, it is, it is a massive ass for them. Yeah, I think Both that's the... the I think yeah, that, to that, be there again, yeah. you want to get Killian, your Killian's back, your Tommy Conroy's. You know, you have Sam Callaghan, you have Enda Hesham back. You know, from the under twenties, I think they're going to add strength and depth. But we all do nothing if the likes of Darren McGill, Jason Doherty, or Conor McStay, and the guys that are coming off the bench do not make an impact. We haven't had an impact especially against Roscommon and I think that's where it's, it's vital from my own perspective I don't want to bring up the war David but the game is only behind a paywall um, so I guess to watch it you have to lump your 12 quid or your 70 odd quid for your annual <coughs> membership to GEA Go um, don't know if you have any views on that like of course the hurling crowd had their uh, views aired last week through the medium of Donal Cusack but um, I guess the football crowd this weekend are going to see that there's a lot of big games not on terrestrial television <laughs> And you know what? A lot of people don't realise it until you're there a half an hour, forty minutes, or you're going, "What channel is this on now?" Or, you know, and that's that's you going. You mean the channel? The game. And I only realised when my um, it was last weekend that my brother said, "Oh, we'll have the we'll have the game." He's paid a subscription to to GEA Go. Um, it's it's it's. I don't think it's right, and I've always said it. I've always said it. We're a national sport. And we should be keeping it on the island. And we should be doing everything to promote it within the island. It's not about, you know, GA Go serves a great purpose for people living outside of the country. But I think to charge, it's like everything else. 
there's so many there's so many subscriptions whether it's your netflix or your sky or your you know it, it comes it, it comes a constant it's your biggest it's your biggest bill is your multimedia um barrier your mortgage journey now mm. now i know electricity prices have gone up you know but it's we're in a cost of living crisis and we're asking people to pay more yeah for our these are our games we we own them we're the we're the ones that are developing them we're like the, the people that are putting massive massive amount of free time volunteering left right and center i think it's it's we should be we should be celebrating rather than playing a game of hangover seek Galway Tyrone uh, Pier Stadium tomorrow evening uh, five fifteen. I uh, like I'm going to use the word cutthroat here after like taking the legs from under the group system, and now I'm going to use the word uh, cutthroat about Group Two. Um, Galway Tyrone Armagh the other big dog in it, and obviously Westmeath are there as well. Uh, Paul Conroy back for Tyrone, uh, back for Galway. Um, when you look at Tyrone though, David, like their best results came in the last three rounds of the league when they had to claw their way to wins over Kerry Monaghan Armagh, uh, like some good scalps. Obviously, the Monaghan loss um, in Oma set them back a bit. Do the leagues? Uh, does that league run suggest there is a kick yet in this Toronto team? Um, maybe they're flattering to deceive. I thought we're going to. You know what? Because they've been on a serious downward spiral, serious uh, lack of performance, lack of of, of 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 everything, and I think cohesion as well from a team perspective, and and you know the number of the players leaving the panel and. It just, it, 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 I think we, they, they were fighting for their lives, but I don't know will we see that the same way in, in, in championship. Like yeah. It's a brilliant group. Armagh, Toronto. It's the one thing, and I, I think the Talton Cup, I'd, I'd like to see, I'd like to see that experience and that kind of going, you know what, going home. It's a championship game for, every, for Westmeath every time they play. But I do think, I honestly do think, they will, they, 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 they could be the ones that will um, spoil the party. And say we're we're going to be in the three out of the four. I think Westmead and Desi they haven't had the, the the most consistent performance, but I think they could. And and it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting. But I don't think that Tyrone will be um will be a dominant force. Do you, are you saying the, that Westmead could be Westmead could be Tyrone? Yeah, or Arma. You're speaking Depends. my lingo here, obviously. This is <laughs> yeah, sure, okay. look at, I, I, yeah, but look at the and I I it has to. And I, I, I do remember, and I'm going, you know what, that'll do Westmead the world of good. That's what I thought was positive about the, the Tatton Cup. Mm. It was a, a national final, to a degree, and they won silverware. They got their holiday. That's, that, you know, that brings that brings cohesion and that brings kind of unity in a, in a team. I think they could they, they could very well um, against a, 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 how will our man fare now after a very, very disappointing defeat on, on penalties against um, Derry the last day. You don't know. Um, Westmead would 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 relish, you know, a, cha- a a game against a game against Galway. Galway might have two games won in their home and hosed and play Westmead. Then um, it it it's it's something like that that I I could see a um, a surprise being in, in in that group. Westmead, of course, as you said, the Tatton Cup champions. The uh, Tatton Cup being the Grand National for also runs, according to Donald Cusack. I don't know what yet what you made of those particular comments David it seems to have riled some people up the wrong way certainly we had Colin O'Rourke um, on the show earlier this week and from a Meath perspective he said they're taking the Tottenham Cup very seriously so um, yeah certainly comments that were interesting yeah it, 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 I think you know Colin took the the, the, the National League series as well um, it, it'd be it'd be very important not to be disrespectful and I think it was totally disrespectful because it nearly Diminishes. I think there was a very positive um, uh, sense of, of excitement or something new last year for the Talton Cup. It was well promoted, well focused on. It got good airtime. You gave it good airtime. Everyone gave it good airtime. Because it is, as it gets to the, the, the concluding stage, it really becomes vitally important to these teams. Because we're not all, we're not all sitting on the King's throne thinking we're royalty and we're hierarchy. There is only one winner ever in the championship, but there's others that are capable of, of having a good year or getting something out of their 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 their, their strife, and and the effort that that these talented cup teams are putting in is as much is as much as the teams that are in this in the groups of four. I think it is it is awful important that the GEA continue to focus on on uh, promoting it and highlighting it and I'd like to see Westmead doing well uh, on the back of last year's performance but totally disrespectful and um, I would I would 
it, I would never look down my nose on anyone, regardless of ability, or, 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 or stature, or, or um, glamour. And, and I think it's, it's, um, it's a very important part of the GM. We're only getting to learn about it. But we shouldn't be, we shouldn't be knocking it in any way or be disrespectful to the, the team's participating in it. I wonder, does uh, Don Logue regret his language choice, whatever, about his, uh, his overall... Probably point? does. He yeah. probably does. Yeah, I'd say if you ask him this week, you're not, Jesus. Could have worded that slightly better. Yeah, more. yeah, um, yeah. Um, you know, sometimes you try to be funny, and uh, when you're not funny and you have no personality, it's it's better it's, not just to be straight. And it's driven, <laughs> <laughs> it's driven the agenda for uh, it's driven the agenda for the week as well. I'll I'll, I'll leave that comment there. Bitter Red, uh, we've Claire Donegal of course as well uh, tomorrow at two o'clock. Bitter Red says, uh, "Get up, David Brady, Sham boys. He was some footballer, and that is uh, probably he was." Probably a good note to leave it on DB. Sorry, sorry about the, the Ben and Holly there, boy. Just my heart nearly went cross. <laughs> you and me both. I worse. don't know what happened. <laughs> Enjoy a GA go and the communion, of course, over the weekend. Good man. See you, boys. God bless. Thanks, Thanks David. Uh, loads of comments coming in there on that uh, that as well, but that was the that was really the pick of them. Right, that is almost uh, not quite it uh, from us for this morning. We have a slot coming up that uh, you know we're obliged to do. It's Jess Kelly. She's <laughs> going to make an eager out of one of us again, I suspect. Um, and she's with us after these. How are you dealing with retirement? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I see what you're doing there. All right. Um, no, listen, it's... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. I mean, I had kind of a slow, gradual uh, fizzle out from professional rugby. So um, I had the big injury probably coming up to four years, maybe a little bit over four years ago. Um and then I had two seasons, I had 18 months of rehab uh, during COVID, which was a long, hell of a long road. And then I had two seasons of trying to come back from it. Um, unbelievably frustrating. Um, poured my heart and soul into it and just my body just wasn't wasn't there. Um, just, just too much damage in that initial injury. So um, it gave me, own particularly, gave me something to work on in the, in the background and and um, to keep myself ticking over and and... You know, when I ultimately did have to retire, it was, you know, the decision was taken out of my hands, but it was almost a kind of a bit of relief um, because, you know, as an athlete, you're kind of taught to always dig in, dig in. And, you know, if, if, if the decision was up to me, I could have still been playing. So um, it was kind of nice on, on that regard after the initial kind of shock mm. of it. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy. I said a few product projects on the go and I'm um, obviously pushing the whiskey now as well which is which is amazing and I've 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 learned so much and had a great journey so far so um yeah I'm I'm, I'm happy Dan Levy in conversation <laughs> with Nathan last night and you can check out that full piece Dan uh, looking ahead to the Champions Cup and uh, final and looking ahead to some Ireland stuff as well up on our YouTube channel uh, the voice you're in the background there Jess Kelly good morning to you hi Hi, um, things. Uh, things are okay. Yeah, they've yeah. been really good so far this morning. So I expect that to continue over the course of this lot. That I don't really know what it's mm -hmm. about, but I'm told that there's been a lot of talk about artificial intelligence over the last while, Jess. And there has that we That's need not, to, um, not just about you now. To Your talk about you know, deep deep fakes and Chat GPT. Mm -hmm. I jump into Chat GPT every other day and sort of ask it something. And well, now I saw you on this very show a little while ago. Mm. I don't know what you were talking week, about. Uh, we were asking. We asked it. I think we asked it. Should Gavin Bazunu Will Gavin Bazunu leave Southampton this summer? Okay. So that is a classic example of how not to use ChatGPT. Mm. There we go. No, it was a hilarious knows. item that got like 15,000 views. But um, but also he also <laughs> or asked the, the top 10 sports broadcasters in the country. So his ego is really leaning into this whole And who, who, I can't, who was in the top 10, Jen? Well, you were certainly there. Joe and, Joe and, Jer, Joe and Jer were there as well. Michal Amarhartik was number one. one. Yeah. Marty was in there. Nathan infamously yeah. did not make the cut. He didn't make the cut. That's it, Shane. That's you. Just Chat GPT seems to know what it's talking about. It really does, because I asked it, "Who is Adrian Barry in Ireland?" Sure. And it said, "I apologise, but I couldn't find specific information about an individual named Adrian Barry yeah. in Ireland, without additional context or details about the person's background or area of expertise. Yeah. It's challenging to provide accurate information. It's possible that Adrian Barry may be a private individual or someone who's not yet widely known Fact. or publicly recognised." But like I mean, area of expertise. Sure, you were onto a loser there straight away. Like mm. I mean, it's not. What? How are you going to possibly? Because you can you can train Chat GPT. Is that right? Yeah. So this is the key thing. At the moment, it's more of a creative assistant tool. It is very very clever, and there are so many benefits to it. But I'm fed up listening to people go, "Oh, I asked it a question and it gave me the wrong answer." Yeah. It's not a search engine. That's not the way it works. It? So it is a it's a conversational. Uh, learning based tool and it can help you synopsize information so the way I've been using it is 
and don't get me in trouble and work here now, but if I have to read like an 80 page report, I can feed that into ChatGPT and I can say, give me the top 10 bullet points about this. Or you can say, write a, you know, eight word tweet promoting off the ball, whatever it is, and it'll take the data you fed in It'll take additional context based on the information that has already been fed. Okay. Uh, and then it'll be a creative tool that you can then tweak and put into your own voice. But people asking things like, who are the top 10 sports broadcasters in Ireland? It can't have an opinion. Like those types of questions where it's opinion based. My biggest sort of question mark with ChatGPT at the moment is we don't fully know the data that it's pulling from. So, you know, if you mm. put that question into Google, you might see an article from Off the Ball, you might see an article from the Indo or the Irish Times or whatever it is. You can see the sources of the information that you're being fed. What ChatGPT is, is it scrapes all of informa- information from all different sites and puts together a really nice, very conversational paragraph for you to read. But there's no citation mm. at all. And that's the fear factor, because although it can be a bit frivolous and a bit fun, there is a serious side to it. Um, you know, we're hearing of schools in the US now are having proper conversations around banning the use of technology as a whole in the classroom. Because of it. Be- just to try and stop yeah. it. Like earlier this week, the CEO of OpenAI, which is the company behind ChatGPT, was before Congress. And he was basically begging them to introduce legislation to regulate this mm. because he said his biggest fear is that this technology will do more harm than good for humanity. But with the right regulation and with proper cop on by the people creating it, it could actually transform humanity. Do so the people it's a bit who creating it have cop on? Do we? Have well, your man answer? does. Like OpenAI is, it's the biggest, most sophisticated application that's out there at the moment. Okay. This is the one that kind of kicked off the whole talk around these types of chatbot, um, sophisticated chatbots. And he is very conscious or he appears to be very conscious of the wider impact. But it's the second it falls into someone's hands that has bad, you know, wants or needs. And uh, yeah, it can go wrong. Um, But what about deep fakes, Jess? Can can deep fakes be done? What a great question, Shane. I'm so glad you asked me. I slide under the desk and uh, out the door. Well, deep fakes, I don't know if you saw the picture of uh, the Pope wearing a really big bomber jacket that was floating around was online brilliant. a little while ago. That was an AI manipulated image. And deep fakes are, they are artificial intelligence uh, layered on top of an image or a photograph using, in some instances, audio to manipulate what a person is doing. So, for example, mm. imagine if someone had five hours on their hands on Wednesday night <laughs> and sat at home weren't watching the Hypothetically, until 10 o'clock on Wednesday night and had a picture of you and had access to the audio archive of Off the Ball. Mm. Imagine what they could do. Jeez, that's amazing. It's a good thought, isn't it? Let's just see if this vision could come to life. Let's just imagine it. Why would I demean myself by engaging in this conversation? If you don't mind, give me a second. It just feels a bit gimmicky for what should be a straightforward round. Well, that's there's just these like nonsense. It's whatever. I, I, whenever I, whenever I open my mouth to do anything other than give an answer, I'm perceived to be moaning. So I probably am moaning to be fair. <laughs> Who's your daddy? <laughs> What's his name? Who's your daddy? That's why it's called the Adrian Barry round. You, if you went to Specsavers and you were wearing, you should have worn your if you were in your glasses. Oh Jesus. It's all accurate and highly embarrassing, but alas, here we are. <laughs> oh wow! The who's your daddy is so disturbing. That the 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 visuals are freaking me out. It's yeah. freaky, right? So just to explain what I did there, so I uh, used a free platform, and this is the scariest bit for me: is this is a free platform. Uh, I took a screenshot of from the YouTube channel of you sitting in studio, and then I got my hands on the audio from just one crappy quiz. That's we're all crappy quiz. Because my initial intent was, I was talking to Colm, and I was going to try and write a script to make you sound like an Egypt, yeah. and then I just thought, Wouldn't be too hard. can you use his own voice? No it's script. grand. <laughs> just lift a segment of the show. And <laughs> so I edited obviously that clip. He didn't say all those stupid things consecutively, but yeah. pretty close to it. Um, and I redubbed it. And the reason I did that was to show how. Anyone can do that. So if you're a politician, if you're a footballer, if you're a celebrity, if you're a person of note, anybody can take your image and your voice and take your words out of context, Mm. montage them together and place it over it. Mm. And look, it may not be the most convincing thing in the world. There's more sophisticated software than the one that I used. But, you know, after I spent all the hours getting the audio and all the rest, all in all, to process that video, it took less than five minutes, which is scary. 
You could end. That is very scary. And like, you could end up with um, people saying, "Oh, that wasn't me. That was a deep fake." At some point, when the technology gets so oh, it's good a cop now, yeah, for people, like, yeah. yeah. And so I think that's one of the fear factors. The other fear factor then, again, if we could all just try and imagine this together as a family, oh, yeah. is if someone took an image <laughs> and if they took somebody else's voice yeah. and dubbed it over it. So you talked to me last week and you were saying that, you know, Kevin Kilban is kind of your spirit animal. Yes. Great idea, yeah. Jeff. So what happens if you cross Adrian Barry and Kevin Kilban? Oh, wow, I don't think I would Let's take this. a look. I'm not, I'm not happy with this. Gen- genuinely not happy with this. This, this, this is poor. This is, um, this is not on. Honestly, that, that's the way that I feel. That is, that is disturbing. <laughs> that's awful. That's, I'm, uh, like, I'm, I, if anybody's got a, like a bucket around somewhere, I don't, I don't feel well. Do you remember the way you were with the hand stuff? The other, that's, yeah. I feel a little bit like that now. That's strange. Yeah. It's kind of strange, isn't it? It's bizarre. But the, the, there are dangers. And obviously we had the, the story this week where the Irish Times held up their hands and said, look, yeah. we were duped here. I'm flagging that these things are fake here now with you guys. But with all that I've seen with the potential of things like ChatGPT and obviously Google and Microsoft and all these other companies are working on them as well. And what I've seen with the AI manipulated images and videos, it's going to be impossible to identify what's real and what's not. Like think about the next US presidential election. I guarantee you we are going to be having debates and conversations around this. And there's a whole host of talk around the ethics of it. Mm. Like I wrote a piece for the Business Post a few months ago around how would you feel if the entire article that I wrote was done by AI? Would you care? What about if your local politician or a minister was giving a really emotive speech around homelessness or the cost of living and that had been written by AI? Would you care? Mm. And at what, where is the line in terms of transparency? Like on social media now, we have hashtag ad, hashtag spawn for all of that. How and where along the line can we introduce regulation and enforcement of regulation for this type of technology? Because, you know, those are kind of gimmicky examples, but there are very sophisticated ones. I fear it's going to be a little bit like catching smoke unless decisions are made now. And this can't be like they're still having conversations about how to regulate Facebook and Twitter and stuff Mm. like that. We can't be 15 years down the line going, you know, in three years, we're going to introduce legislation. It kind of has to have happened yesterday for it to be impactful. So, uh, yeah, who knows? We probably will be is the uh, the reality. And it's sort of my instinct when you asked that question was to say, no, no, I'd definitely rather the real person to be doing that thing. But like it does also feel that narratives move on quickly and in a couple of years time it could be just a case that oh yeah that's just an accepted thing and that's like you know Joe Biden at 95 mm-hmm. when he's you know you know the conspiracy theories that are out there um, we could have Joe, Joe Biden who's moved on to other other things uh, the afterlife and still yeah. giving us you know it, it can open up all sorts of it can but weirdness. like at that um, congressional committee that I watched on Wednesday before I spent five hours messing around with your image was uh, really interesting because one of the senators Robert Blumenthal said he started off by playing a clip of a piece of AI that uh, a piece of audio that was manipulated it learned his voice mm. and he played like a 30 second clip of the AI it wrote the script and it read the script and he said look this is amazing when we're out in the campaign trail or whatever to save our voice it would be great but what if somebody else uses the exact same software and the exact same techniques that I did to have my voice say that Mm. Ukraine should surrender Mm. or something like that Mm. that could have catastrophic Mm. implications and and like uh, nations are different so uh, the US might legislate for that or we might legislate for that and there may be another country in the world who is not legislating for that and using that as propaganda or like you know but this is uh, it it's so easy to weaponise it like there was a famous example a few years ago of an app called SimSimi that was doing the rounds in primary schools and the principals of the primary primary schools had to come together to send a letter home to the parents saying if your child is using this app please get them to delete it because it was an AI chatbot that could be manipulated and bully other children so you could ask the question who is Adrian Barry and it could say Adrian is whatever I could ask the question it'll give me the same answer okay. it gave you and then I can go well actually no Adrian Barry is X okay. Y and Z so then the next person okay. who asks gets the bullying answer Okay. Mm. so this type of technology has been around for an awful long time there's a lot of focus on, on it at the moment because it's going mainstream 
but they've had a lot of time to think about the implications of this and if we don't get it right it's going to go very wrong. Is there a danger around exams and that sort of thing as well that people have that kind of technology live? Yeah for sure general? yeah and, and like even when you're submitting your your written work or your like the continuous oh, yeah. assessments type, type of stuff and there's been a lot of talk about how the future of education will work should we do more learning at home and all that kind of jazz if you can't trust the the technology the kids are interacting with or you can't trust the kids to not use the technology um, that is going to be massively problematic so. it's black mirror stuff isn't it like it, it it's yeah. kind of funny it's funny when I first started seeing the deep fake stuff in the Tom Cruise video I think that went around yeah. that was so realistic but now when you actually think about it in detail that you're like this is terrifying well it's like a modern day version when I did my Irish exam I my next door neighbour was from the Gaeltacht and so I used to go in for grounds and I wasn't especially Sorry, I wasn't at all studious. Uh, and so she would say, okay, here's five. If you learn off these five essays, when the topics come up for the written exam, you're going to have something in the ballpark. Mm. I thought, I'm not really going to, I'm not going to learn the five. Yeah. I'll learn one <laughs> and I'll take my chances. So the uh, essays came up with a list of options, one of which was an essay about uh, old people. I'd learned off an essay about young people. So I started off the first line to say, Neil Masorbe, egg the Shandini from the uh, young Dini. And uh, away I went. So it's kind of like a modern day version of that, really. Mm. It's exactly the same. <laughs> Copy and paste. I'm so yeah. glad I get to work. Have you any other learn. ways to embarrass us, or is that? Uh, that that's all. Okay. That's that's it for this week. I'll come yeah. back with more, though. I did please, try to do please. Shane, but it, the AI didn't take to his face. The same way face. he didn't take right. to VR, AI didn't take. See, to him. that's yeah, that's yeah. that is an insult. Technology and me just don't work. No, I think it's actually a good thing that that really? it doesn't pick up my face. Yeah. Oh, well, it's definitely a good thing. I'm delighted. Like, this not morning. even ChatGPT to take you out. Like, that's the. <laughs> uh, yeah, possibly. Burn. A, a uh, cream club burn there. I do enjoy our chat suggest. Thanks a million for coming so in. And for the effort during the week. That's, so that's yeah, yeah. really above. It's way more preparation than anybody has ever put into this show. I think it's pathetic. And anyone who walked by my laptop over the last few days have just seen pictures of your face. <laughs> They're like my reporting yeah. you. <laughs> disturbing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, it was fun. It was uh, enjoyable the last 10 or 15 Who's your daddy? Thanks a million. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Put that loop that up so get up with that GPT. <laughs> Monday show, Jar and Shane are going to be back after a bumper weekend of sport, especially extended Gillette Labs performance rankings. We'll have Alan Quinlan of the rugby of course, Sarah Donovan on the weekend's GA, as will Anthony Moyles, plenty more as well, besides. And uh, from myself and Shane, I'm from Jess. It's really us saying have a fabulous Friday. OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now.